Gabbard, St. Pete City Council. Sandra Bradbury, Mayor of the City of Pinellas Park. Hello, Janet Long, Pinellas County Government, County Commissioner. Countywide. Countywide, <laughs> District 1. <laughs> we Everybody. I'm going to make sure you didn't oh. forget that part. We have one more. Oh, I mean, coming just to the table, we're just introducing, so introduce yourself. Go ahead. You're, you're the Grace only Seal. <laughs> <laughs> Pinellas County Commission also. Um, and before we get started with the invocation and pledge, uh, just a reminder to everybody here that uh, WITS evaluation is due next Friday. And I'll, and I'll kindly, I'll, I'll probably remind you one more time at the end of the meeting, but just to put it on your radar screens now. Um, and uh, Mayor Bujalski will lead us in an invocation and a pledge. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you for the wonderful weather that we are having. It has been so nice to be able to walk outside and see the sunshine, and we appreciate that. And we want to ask your blessing for all the folks that serve here on our board today in their respective roles here as well as their roles at their other government agencies. Thank you for the work the staff has done, and please um, enlighten our hearts and help us make wise decisions on behalf of the residents of Pinellas County. Amen. 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 Pledge allegiance Amen. To, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. All right, uh, we are citizens to be heard. Is there anybody who would like to come forward and speak to the board on anything related to transportation? I don't see anybody running forward. So we'll move on to uh, a recognition and announcements. Uh, Whit? Yes, we have uh, Becky Afonso, who is the um, executive of the Florida Bicycle Association. She'd like to uh, say a few words to the board. And we'll go down. And Good afternoon. Afternoon. The Florida Bicycle Association, what we call FBA, is a membership-based 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is bicycling education and promotion of smart cycling. So FBA is not a bicycle club. We are and always will be people, businesses, organizations, and communities working together to build a bicycle-friendly Florida that benefits all. FBA annually recognizes those individuals, communities, etc., that share our mission and vision. Pinellas County, quote, the most dangerous place to bicycle in America, unquote. This according to the Wall Street Journal last September. I'm putting it right there. I'm not here to defend or ar argue the article. I'm here to acknowledge that in the face of these negative headlines stands a steadfast agency. An agency not in denial, but in solution. That agency is Forward Pinellas. As a resident and cyclist in Pinellas County, it is reassuring that Forward Pinellas, under your leadership and that of Executive Director Whit Blayton, understands the complexity of <coughs> transportation crashes and does not shy away from fulfilling the mission to forge effective partnerships among public agencies, citizens, and the business community for improvements. This is no small task for the most densely populated county in the state of Florida. And remember, you wrote something about that <laughs> recently. <laughs> so in addition to being the executive director of the Florida Bicycle Association, which happens to be headquartered in the great city of Oldsmar, I serve on the Forward Pinellas Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee and the Citizens Advisory Committee. And I witnessed firsthand how Forward Pinellas engages the public, fosters creative problem solving, and cultivates the team environment. Every one of us, as a user in the transportation system, must be responsible and accountable, and since, excuse me, accountable. <laughs> for our role in the transportation system. What strikes me is how accessible, knowledgeable, and sincere Forward Pinellas is, even when things are not going well. So if I go back to New York, I'd like to quote a New York Times bestselling author, Tim Tebow. Quote, 
When you know you are not alone, when you know others are fighting a battle alongside you, it makes things a little more bearable, unquote. Make no mistake, this county is a great place to ride a bicycle in. And thanks no, no small part to Forward Pinellas. Always working and always seeking to align goals and actions across jurisdictions to make it so. Again, no small task for the most densely populated county in the state of Florida. So this afternoon, it is my honor as the Executive Director of the Florida Bicycle Association to present our 2018 Supporting Agency of the Year Award to you, Forward Pinellas. Awesome. They, they like to edit me out every once in a while. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Lane so. Mm -hmm. of that, yeah. Which is going to tie into bikes. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. I wanted to say a couple things, and I'll turn it over to the chairman. Um, first of all, thanks for quoting Tim Tebow on the day I'm wearing orange and blue. <laughs> uh, warms my heart. Uh, but, you know, I really want to acknowledge the work of uh, our partner agencies because we couldn't achieve any success without help from the Florida Department of Transportation, without help from Pinellas County, which really was behind building the Pinellas Trail and, and all the trail connections, and then our local government partners, because we have some great trail projects. And we're working on complete streets uh, throughout uh, this county. And complete streets is something that uh, is not about just slowing down traffic. It's about making places accessible for everybody uh, and inviting. And there's an economic development and safety aspect to that. So I really just want to thank FPA. Uh, for the award and for the opportunity to uh, just say a few things about the state of cycling in Pinellas County, and we're working on it. Um, and it's always going to be a work in progress. It forever will be. But I can't tell you how many people I've run into um, who just say, we love it here, we love being in Pinellas County, and we came here because of all the wonderful trails that are nearby. So it does have an effect. Thank you. I think you said it beautifully. Um, the, the FDOT partnership has really been critical, the partnership with the county, obviously. Um, and when the FDOT, the new secretary, when he came, when I, not new anymore, but when he first came, the first thing he said, the most important thing that was on his plate was public safety and making sure that the numbers of deaths, whether pedestrian or bicyclist or otherwise, would, would be lessened. And uh, we have a Vision Zero plan. We've kind of thrown a realistic bent at it to try to bring it down, bring down our fatalities in the county. It's really critically important that we do all that we can. Um, we're talking about connecting trails, and uh, we've had some, I've had some conversations with him about how do we connect trails over wide roads. And uh, he's very interested in maybe trying to address that issue. Um, and so I think he's really putting his, quote, money where he really, what he really believes in. And so we'll continue working at it um, because it is a work in progress, but we have so many wonderful trails and doing such great things in the county. And thank you for all that you do in your organization. Appreciate that. Good. Thank you. While you guys are coming back up, if you don't mind me adding, um, we need to also send a big thank you out to Becky and her team because they go out to local school ev events at the beginning of the year and pass out helmets to the kids that are going to be bike riding and everything. So we want to say thank you to them for going out and uh, encouraging kids as well as young adults to wear the helmets that they need while they're bicycling. Yeah, it's important. Thank you. Sure. Yes. That's so true. It's from, from a generation here that never wore helmets when we were young. <laughs> like I look at them now and think, gosh, why didn't we wear them? It looks so different when you don't see people wearing them now. So I think that's a good thing. It takes, mm -hmm. it takes time. We, we didn't wear seatbelts either. No, we didn't do that. <laughs> no, you're right. We had seatbelts. They just went across our laps. They didn't go anyplace else. Never use cell phones. Of course, we didn't have them either. So. Um, anyway, all right. So... Um, We'll go on down to the consent agenda. We have three items on there. Approval of the minutes of March 13th. Um, we have a, an FDOT and a St. Pete Beach uh, um, committee appointment uh, recommendation for the LCB and TCC. And then the authorization for the executive director to distribute a letter of complete streets. 
Uh, I need a motion for approval, please. Motion. Second. Okay, second. Commissioner uh, Sofer made the motion. Oh, Commissioner Sofer made the motion. Did you get that? Okay. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to the uh, public hearing. We have two sub-threshold uh, um, cases and uh, amendments, and so I'll go ahead and read the procedures, if everybody will bear with me, because they need to be read, But uh, and they're both for uh, sub-threshold. Um, and at this time, we'll begin the uh, uh, PPC public hearing. We'll hear uh, the threshold cases first, and in this case, we're only going to hear two sub-threshold. Um, I will ask the four panel staff to uh, present the items. Then um, any of the applicant governments desiring to do so may address their items. If necessary, we'll call upon a representative of the Planners Advisory Committee. Once these reports are given, I will ask for proponents and then opponents and any other citizen wishing to be heard. And we'll hear uh, rebuttals by the applicant if necessary and a staff response. And then the board will ask questions and uh, we'll close the public hearing for deliberation and action. So. Let's go ahead and get started with the uh, first case, 1907. So I'll invite Jerry Austin of our staff up to make the presentation today. Good afternoon, everyone. Jared Austin, Ford Pinellas. Uh, today I'll be going over a sub-threshold countywide plan map amendment, CW 1907, submitted by the City of Clearwater. Um, so the City of Clearwater is seeking to amend a property from public semi-public to residential low medium. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the redevelopment from a place of worship to multifamily residential. So the location is at 1625 Union Street, Clearwater, uh, and the area size is roughly 4.88 acres, and the existing uses, again, are a place of worship, and the surrounding uses are residential and institutional. Uh, so this is the front of the subject property. This is uh, some of the residential north of the subject property. Uh, this is some of the residential to the east of the subject property. And this is the institutional use to the west of the subject property. Uh, so again, this is the uh, current category of public semi-public. And under the permitted uses, you can see that at a countywide level, we do allow for uh, residential uses. However, the local institutional use that falls under our public semi-public category does not allow for the redevelopment uh, of the property to residential. Hence, the amendment to residential low medium, which would support this redevelopment. Um, based on this, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with locational characteristics for the residential low medium category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in Section 6531 of the countywide rules. Okay. Um, is there anybody from the City of Clearwater that? We don't speak. normally bring them up unless we need them to. Okay. Good. Is it really, we don't normally do that. Huh? So, um, okay. Anybody, anybody uh, out there? Propo any proponents for it? Any op opponents? Okay. Um, how about the commit uh, up here on the on the on the day? Does anybody have any questions of staff? No. no. Okay. So, uh, thank you for that, and we'll need a motion for approval. Move approval. Second. Got it. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll hear case number 1908. Thank you. So again, sub-threshold countywide plan map amendment CW 1908 submitted by uh, Pinellas County. Uh, so Pinellas County is seeking to amend <coughs> property from preservation and residential low medium to recreation open space. And the purpose of the amendment is to provide for consistency between the local future <coughs> land use and zoning. Um, so the location of the northernmost parcel um, on that aerial right there uh, is at the southwest corner of alternate US 19 and Wailani Road. And for the southernmost parcel, uh, it's approximately 400 feet west of alternate US 19 and Harry Street. Uh, and the area size of the combined parcels is roughly 1.61 acres. Uh, and the existing uses are vacant. Um, however, the surrounding uses of which they are part of include the Wailani a Girl Scout camp and uh, Wall Springs Park. Uh, and the surrounding uses are recreation, preservation, residential, and employment. Um, so this is just north of the preservation parcels, which were the northernmost parcels on the previous aerial map. 
This is to the, some of the residential to the west of those same preservation parcels. Uh, this is to the east of the uh, residential parcels, which are the southernmost parcels on the uh, aerial map. And this is the southeast of those residential parcels. <clears throat> so here you can see the uh, current countywide plan map categories of residential low, medium, and preservation, along with their permuted, permitted uses. Um, and under our permitted uses, we do allow for recreational uses. However, the uh, county has since adopted uh, local future land use that would be better supported by the recreation open space category, um, hence the proposed amendment. And uh, based on this, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purposes and is consistent with locational characteristics for the rec recreation open space category. And on balance, we believe it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Thank you. Mm -hmm. any, uh, any proponents or opponents that would like to speak to this? Okay, I'll bring it back here. Any questions from the board? I have a question. Yes. Um, do you normally contact the residents in the area about uh, land use change like this? Are they, like, the resident that property that you mm -hmm. showed, are mm -hmm. they even aware of the land use change? Uh, the county does submit uh, at their level a notification, um, and we did have a resident who called just curious as to what um, the land use change was going to be uh, a part of. Um, but other than that, yeah, that would that would be about it. Okay. Thank you. Michael wants to address that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Michael Schoderbach, Planning Department for Pinellas County. <laughs> This is, it's part of a larger uh, rezoning area. If we could switch to the, the overhead. Everything outlined in, in red is involved in a, in a zoning change with just these two areas uh, in front of you today for a land use amendment. It is part of uh, the master plan for the Wall Springs Park. Um, just down here, they're doing expansion. And then the Wailani Girl Scout Camp, or we contacted them since they're in between. We notified all the surrounding property owners in the area around it, in the area, so they are aware. You know, around it. But, uh, we okay. haven't had any. Thank you. Any I appreciate that. From that so. Mayor Bujowski, do you have a question? I was just going to ask if, so is it remaining, I know what you're zoning it to, but is the plan that it will be <laughs> remain to be a part of Wall Springs? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any, any other questions? <laughs> Bless, Bless you. you. This is just basically a cleanup. Do you zone it to? Yeah, we're, we're zoning a couple of different areas. <laughs> we have a, a, a resource-based preservation area and a facilities-based preservation area, which on the, on the local level with the zoning, uh, that'll make it more compatible with the expansion of the, what they're going to do out there for uh, trails and you know kayak ramp versus areas that'll be less disturbed. Okay. There are some residences there, yeah. too, but this yeah. will, the, most of that area is preservation, so it kind of, <coughs> it kind of fits in. Bless you. Any other questions? Need a motion, please? Move to approve. Thank you. I think he got, he got okay. it. Okay. Some of our all written. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to presentations and action items. Um, Commissioner Long, you're up first with PSTA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to make the board aware of the fact that we went to Tallahassee last week, Monday and Tuesday, and on Tuesday we had 16 meetings in the Capitol complex. We were very, very busy. One of the key issues that we were addressing were the excessive trips that PSTA is providing that should be funded by Medicaid. And the Florida House Bill 411 and Senate Bill 301 would authorize Uber and Lyft to be Medicaid transit providers, which would allow easier access to health services for those folks in need and provide a much needed um, you know, impact to PSTA's paratransit budget. 
We also met with legislators to promote the region asking for our $1.5 million appropriations for T. Barta, and we were very well received, and it is going to make it into the conference committee, so that's a very positive step. So I think, as a lot of you know, we, we PSTA, has been working hard over the past five years to increase our savings efficiencies and our grant opportunities, and we are already operating efficiently as the lowest cost service provider amongst our T's in the American Bus Benchmarking Group. And I want to point out that our annual budget is a little over $80 million. A comparable agency like ours in a community the size of Pinellas <coughs> County, who is running a very effective and efficient system, would have a budget of about $220 million. So that should tell you a little something about how unfunded we are in terms of providing the best possible service for our citizens. And I think it's a testament to the leadership of PSTA, Forward Pinellas, and our new county administrator that for the first time we are working collaboratively together to try to resolve these issues both for PSTA but for the county as well because we are 40 years behind the times. Um, we didn't take a vote at our board meeting in March about cutting our services, but we do have a public hearing tonight at PSTA uh, headquarters at 6 o'clock to discuss our proposed service cuts that we absolutely do not want to have to make because we know that that just um, isn't helpful in trying to increase efficiencies and that people really do depend on our services to get back and forth to work. So we, again, are having that public hearing this evening and we will be discussing this issue again at our board meeting coming up on April, April 20, uh, whatever the date is, April 24th, I guess. Yes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and um, Hopefully between now and then we will have or begin to craft a path forward, not only for our agency but for uh, the county as well. Now as for the most exciting piece, Brad can attest because he was there as well. Brad and myself and the senior staff of PSTA spent about four hours on St. Pete Beach last night at their city council meeting listening to their concerns about the service and the BRT line. Uh, they were very emphatic about what they wanted and what they did not want. And thanks to the eloquency of our executive director, who spoke on behalf of not only the county, but the entire region, and how important this line was for the beginning and the catalyst of a spine which will eventually connect us all the way over into Tampa International Airport and out to Wesley Chapel. Um, I do think that his articulation of the issues really helped tamp down the rhetoric. Needless to say, there were some agitators, for lack of a better word, and no-sayers, or people who always want to vote no. Um, just about any progressive thing in the audience, and so that proved dis difficult at best to listen to. Are you paying attention? Yes, we are. Okay. Just talking. Just thought I'd ask. Your words are so inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. To, yeah. yeah. We're just talking whether it was small or large P for progressive. You said progressive. We said he said small P. <laughs> anyway, it was. Um, affirming to learn while we were in the meeting last night that the Federal Transit Authority announced five new BRT projects throughout the United States that they have released funding for from 1.8 million 16 miles um, to 87.4 million in federal dollars and those grants went to Spokane, Washington, Portland, Oregon, Reno, Nevada, 
Albany, New York, and Jacksonville, Florida. So it makes us feel more confident than ever that money from the transit agency at the feds is starting to flow down and we are in the pipeline. So everybody, please keep your fingers crossed with a little luck and the good graces of God. We'll make it this time. That's the end of my report, Mr. Chair. Any yes, questions? <clears throat> Thank you for your great report, Commissioner, and your leadership on that issue. And we were listening intently. Um, back to the PSTA funding issue, though, I'm, you know, certainly glad to see that, you know, the county and PSTA and Fort Pinellas are working to come up with a solution. But as you know, we had some folks come to our commission meeting a few weeks ago and said, you know, if the commission doesn't put X amount in, these routes are going to go away in June or July, which is even before our next fiscal year. So what is the short-term plan? Mm -hmm. I know y'all talked about reserves perhaps so that those routes aren't eliminated, you know, in the short term. Thank you for asking that very good question. We did have a robust conversation at our last board meeting. We did not take a vote. But we did build a consensus among the board so, since we had been so conservative with our budgeting process and every year have been putting X amount of dollars in reserve that we would, for the interim time, we would dip into our reserve to carry us forward until such time as we have that next funding workshop. You may remember the one we had at Seminole campus of the St. Pete College mm -hmm. uh, a couple months ago and we committed at that time to all work together to come up with a solution that would be short term and long term. And I think we're all really, really smart people and we're all dedicated to not just keeping pushing the can down the road, which we've been doing for 40 years and we'll, we'll get there. It just requires a consistent and constant movement forward with everybody. Commissioner, I mean, Commissioner Eggers is on that board and we all agreed that that was the right thing to do. The money belongs to the citizens and as long as we can continue to provide the best possible service that we can. Um, there are, it was significant you know, in St. Pete Beach last night to hear that 41% of the employees for St. Pete Beach come from St. Petersburg. And so for those folks that are going back and forth to work, <coughs> this service is critical to them. It's a lifeline to their quality of life. Whit, no. did you have a comment? I just, yeah, thank you for those comments about the meeting last night. I just want to say that I thought it was a really good opportunity for us to have a conversation with the St. Pete uh, Beach City Commission and understand some of their uh, concerns and perspectives. And I thought that at a commission level, it was a, it was a pretty good dialogue. Uh, they expressed their concerns, uh, some of their frustrations, uh, some of the things they've been hearing, and PSTA was able to clarify misconceptions and um, reach out, I guess, with an olive branch of working together in partnership. And so the new city manager uh, of St. Pete Beach and PSTA CEO Brad Miller are gonna sit down and work out an agreement that they are going to commit to paper. Uh, and then the commission will act on that um, in, in, I think, 30 days. And the idea would be that that would give them a comfort level for moving forward with the project. So, I mean, that's how you get things done. Correct. And, um, you know, it was a little um, hard to listen to at times, um, but Lots. I think there was a clearing of the, the grievances, and sometimes that, that's needed. And, well, to um, that point, and thank you for saying all of that, <laughs> Whitten, to that point, I did send every one of them a little note as I was leaving them, thanking for them for giving us the opportunity right. to reset the dialogue and allow us to keep on communicating. I do think there is a huge disconnect between maybe the county and the city in terms of the partnership that the city has with the, with the county because one of the counselors 
um, indicated that it would be really nice if the county could step up once in a while and help them. And given my promise to try to be really, really good during Lent, <laughs> <laughs> I sat in my seat and stayed quiet <laughs> because all I could think of, I started rowing through all of the different ways that we partner with the city. Um, and so I thought it was a great opportunity for our new county administrator, who I guess we can't really say he's so new anymore. He's been here for almost six months. But to meet with the new city manager, that was his very first city council meeting last night. Really? So there's, they could you know, maybe patch up together and really help to craft a great solution that would be more amenable to everyone. Yeah. May I ask um, what amount do you have in reserves? Dollar amount? Oh, we don't have Debbie here today. Do you know that exact number, Cassandra? It's about 29. I was going to say 20 million, but I wasn't quite sure. 20 million? 20. Okay. Great. Thank you. Approximately. Don't hold us to it, but I can find that out pretty quickly for you. Okay. Um, yeah, and I just, the only thing I wanted to add to that, and I appreciated your comments, appreciate you all being there last night to kind of try to talk um, a little more clearly uh, based on that article that came out. Um, and I, but I do, you know, I, go, I think on these projects like this one or like the trail project that we've talked about in North County, they're long lasting <coughs> projects uh, from conception to implementation. And so, from time to time, we do have residents who either were engaged and didn't get their way initially or haven't been engaged that come out and express their opinions. Now, there are some people who are constantly against some of our transit issues, but I do think it's, it's healthy. I think it's healthy to hear from our residents all the time because it does make us all kind of take a look again at what we're doing, and if it needs to be tweaked, fine. If it needs to be reaffirmed, fine. I think it's all good. So. Thank you for being down there last night. And, it was uh, tough. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, appreciate your being down there. Um, now we'll move to Commissioner Seal for the Tibarda update. There's really nothing to report because our March meeting was canceled, but we will be meeting April 25th. And while I haven't seen a full agenda, um, I do know that we will be discussing the federal lobbyists and a award to um, that lobbyist, whomever it's going to be. So. And. If I may yes, offer yeah. a clarification, Commissioner Seal, the meeting's on the 26th. I'm sorry, 26th. Friday the 26th. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you. And we'll get uh, more uh, next month uh, for sure. And uh, Chelsea, or, oh, she's on her way, of course, <laughs> to give us a uh, Advantage Pinellas uh, report. Thank you. We're going to tag team this a little bit. Uh, Chelsea's still under the weather, so she's okay. going to get through this part. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> so go easy on her, please. <laughs> All right, so just to bring you up to speed on some of the activities that we've been doing with the Advantage Pinellas Plan. Uh, we brought this to you last month. We recent, recently completed uh, the development of our population and employment projections. So the heat maps that you see in front of you show you where that growth is anticipated to be allocated between now and 2045. Uh, we did uh, send this out to every single one of the local governments and received comments back from most of them. And we made adjustments based on the local government comments so that each of the local governments can now use these projections for a uh, multitude of planning activities moving forward. Uh, we've also been uh, looking at automated and connected vehicles. Uh, based on guidance that we received um, from uh, Tallahassee, FDOT in Tallahassee, uh, we looked at three different scenarios for automated vehicles in the future. Uh, we looked at uh, what would happen if they kind of slowly made their way into the fleet, uh, what would happen if um, there was kind of a more mid-level um, uh, implementation of automated vehicles where we increased the freeway capacity by 33% and the capacity of the arterial roads by 15%. And then we also looked at a very aggressive strategy where we increased the freeway capacity by 75 and the arterials by 35%. And then we went ahead and we used uh, the adopted long range plan and we looked out to 2040 to see what those impacts on the transportation network might be. There's a lot of numbers on here, um, but what we did see is that the vehicle miles traveled increased in every single one of those scenarios because there's additional capacity and the vehicles could kind of drive closer together, a lot more trips were induced. Um, obviously, in that ultimate traveler assist, which was that high level um, assumption, we saw an increase of 5% of the vehicle miles traveled. Um, but then when we looked at the vehicle hours traveled, so how much time you actually sat sitting in your vehicle, um, we saw an a decrease of up to 9%. 
So while there were more cars on the road, there was more capacity on the roadways, and those cars could move faster and spend less time sitting in traffic. And then we looked at the volume to capacity ratios of the roadways as well, and you can see an incremental decrease um, in the, the what, what we consider, um, how many vehicles are on the road, I'm sorry, the capacity of the roadways. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at right now is also identifying what we call our constrained roads. And really what that means is if we identify a road as constrained, we say that one or more through lanes of general purpose traffic will not be added to those roadways. In the past, what we've done is we've kind of looked at, all right, what roads are at capacity or nearing capacity? And if we didn't plan to widen them, we called them all constrained. And that kind of backs you into a little bit of a corner when you're planning for future uh, transportation projects. So what we want to do is a little bit different approach uh, with this plan. Uh, these are the three roadways that are what we call policy constrained. That means a governing body um, has taken action to say, we will not be widening these roads beyond the existing condition. Now that doesn't mean that you can't do ITS improvements, intelligent transportation systems, um, you can't do turn lanes or intersection improvements, it just means that we're not going to further widen these roads or add any additional through capacity. So we have Alt-19 uh, in northern Pinellas County, uh, East Lake Road um, over in the East Lake area, and then Olmerton Road. So those are the three that have some kind of official policy constraint. And I want to be clear where that official policy constraint came from. That was either a policy of the Board of County Commissioners or a policy of a local government or a policy of the Metropolitan Planning Organization? Yes, the MPO took action to constrain Alt-19 and Olmerton Road in past years and the uh, Board of County Commissioners constrained East Lake Road through their comprehensive plan. Um, so what we've identified here in those blue lines, these are what we're going to call our non-constrained roadways. These are the roadways where we know we're going to be adding capacity in the future and we want to send that message to uh, the Florida Department of Transportation that these roadways right here, there are all options are on the table. So we have US-19 in northern Pinellas County, uh, I-275, uh, the full extent of it, Gandy Boulevard from just west of the uh, US-19 over across the bridge, and then there are a few uh, county facilities as well, uh, Starkey Road um, in the um, western part of the county, and also Forest Lakes between 580 and 584. Oh, all right. And with that, we want to have a, a statement in the long range plan that says, all other roadways, we do not anticipate to add additional through lanes at this time, but we're not going to take the official stance to constrain them. Um, just an update on some of our public outreach activities. Uh, we did have our focus group last fall, and tomorrow night we'll be having another one. Uh, what we're doing is, as we develop the long range plan, the Advantage Pinellas plan, we're structuring around what we're calling our advantages. And these are either advantages that um, already exist in Pinellas County or that could be realized through implementation of the plan. So we're going to bring that to our focus groups, bounce some ideas off of them, and hopefully at your next meeting we'll be able to bring you uh, what we're thinking as the framework for the plan and highlighting those advantages. Uh, and then they'll also be providing some input into our needs plan. And just a little bit, we're bringing back the same group of folks for the most part who are at the uh, focus group back in the fall. Mm -hmm. And then we have our third focus group. It'll be the same group of folks. And the idea is to bring along a group of citizens from a cross section of the county um, who will be a little more informed uh, about the process. Uh, they will have seen the progress of the development of the plan. And hopefully we'll be able to cultivate some champions out of that. Um, and right now we're also moving into what we call our needs assessment phase. And this is where we identify all the projects that we believe are needed for mobility in Pinellas County between now and 2045. And these are just some rough maps, um, but we're currently uh, testing some of these different roadway projects. And we're also working very closely with PSTA to identify what we're calling our priority transit corridors. And we know that there's going to be transit on a lot more roadways than just these. But these are kind of those, uh, those corridors that already have good service. Um, they can really benefit from additional increased service in the future. So this is where we should be really investing in our future land use strategy to make sure that the land uses in these areas are supportive of the transit that we believe is coming. Uh, right now we've kind of uh, taken a step to identify um, based on the focus of the corridor. Uh, so in, if it has an intra-county focus, a regional focus, or a tourism-oriented focus. Um, but we're going to be continuing to refine these, working these with our local governments and through our committees. And we're going to bring you back a much more comprehensive presentation on the needs assessment at your meeting next month. 
Uh, so coming soon, uh, we'll be doing some testing of our needs projects. Uh, that map on the right, that's kind of a heat map. The darker the color, uh, the more congestion um, is on the roadway network. We use a regional travel demand model to help us kind of identify where or predict where we think we're going to see congestion issues. So we'll go through and we'll be testing a few different roadway projects in a few different areas to see how they perform. And then where we see the best results, we'll be bringing that back to you as well as part of that assessment. Right. Once we have our needs plan and projects identified, we'll match them up with our resources and help develop that cost feasible plan that will be coming to you later this summer. And with that, I'll take any questions. Can you go Commissioner Wojcicki. Thanks. Mayor Wojcicki. Um, the <clears throat> constrained roads slide that you had. Yes. Can Can I see that? Mm -hmm. So, in our future, in our plan, this is our twenty forty plan. Mm -hmm. Twenty forty-five. Okay. I'm sorry. Twenty forty-five. Okay. These roads are still going to be class. You're, they're proposing that these roads are still going to be classified as constrained. Yes, they currently have constraints on them, just right. those three corridors. And until a board takes action to overturn that, they they stay constrained. Well, I mean, I know that FDOT is doing a corridor study on Alt 19. Yes. Um, and I know that they haven't proposed anything, but I don't know if it's because of the chicken or the egg, mm -hmm. because it's already classified as constrained. Because there are areas on Alt 19, at least on the north end, mm -hmm. that could theoretically have right turn lanes. Um, you know, there's there's right of way available, mm -hmm. and so I would be concerned about saying a constraint that this is all constrained and that they're not going to ever add a lane to it. Well, and the constraint doesn't. It wouldn't apply to say right turn lanes or areas where we could add center turn lanes. It just means that it won't go from say like a two lane facility to a four lane facility all the way through. So you could still do other operational improvements. It would not preclude that. Okay. Traffic okay. signal adjustments, things like that. Fair game. Because when I when I look at even in Dunedin, when I think of between Michigan and <clears throat> Tampa Road. Mm -hmm. Let's say there is area there that has plenty of right of way to add another lane mm -hmm. to move people quicker, mm -hmm. and that's a huge bottleneck right in there. Mm -hmm. So what we're what we're going to do is work with the department uh, on the Alt 19 quarter study that they are wrapping up uh, this summer sometime. We have reached out to them to set up a meeting to sit down with them and understand the recommendations. You all gotten a very high level overview of some of the concepts that they've identified in that plan. I think they're still waiting on the southern section to be completed in terms of documenting the, the study findings. Um, so that will take shape probably in May is my guess and we'll sit down and we'll share with you. going to ask those questions. Yeah, then. we will ask those questions very specifically about are there some short segments where it might make sense to add another through lane and get an evaluation of that and then bring that back to this board to determine if you wanted to lift that constraint designation. So just because it's on this map, we're just telling you going forward, that's the policy framework. And if we want to change that with this long range plan, you'll have to take some sort of proactive action to change that. But in the meantime, we certainly want the department to consider all options and they have not been directed by us to leave certain options off the table because this is a constrained designation. Okay. It's, it's an open-ended study, and I think they would come and tell you that they, they did look at all options. So we'll keep well, following. But their focus... I'm not convinced of that. Their focus was on uh, increasing multimodal safety and accessibility, so yes. that was in their scope as kind of the primary motivation. But um, they are looking at bottlenecks and turn lanes and other ways to keep the flow of traffic going. And we recognize there, there's a lot of congestion on Old 19. Mm -hmm. no. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And I had sort of the same question about East Lake Road, but you, it, I think you said that that was determined by the Board of County Commissioners Correct. some time ago. Mm -hmm. It was before, obviously before my time, but do you remember when it was, Commissioner Seale? We looked at uh, multimodal. No, I'm talking about East Lake, uh, East Lake Lane expansion. Right now it's considered a constrained road. Um, but, because the I mean, last study I remember we <clears throat> actually looked at, um, and Commissioner Welch may have to help me with this, but we looked at doing a bus project. Remember, and that's the last study I remember on East Lake. That was two thousand three. 
2003. Yeah, I did that. Thank you. <laughs> well, you we, did it. So, you, of course, you would remember it. <laughs> it's Woods. But, but I think you have a county comprehensive plan overlay mm -hmm. uh, that constrains East Lake Road as a two lane roadway mm -hmm. um, as part of the land use plan for that area. And that's something we certainly can have a conversation with the County Planning and Public Works Department about. We recognize that's a, that's a, a big need. It is to yeah. address, yeah. but we're we're, we're going to have a, a kind of a, a forum, transportation forum up in North County, and that come that that will be discussed. And I just want to make sure I was un yeah. clearly understood where that lay. So we'll just have to take action. The county commissioners will have to take action to unconstrain it. Or if there's a recommendation right. for an improvement that the right. community supports, yes, right. absolutely. Gotcha. Okay. And you know, incidentally, Whit and I also had this conversation because when we finish up the. Roosevelt connector and the gateway connector. Um, I had been thinking about it, then I had an email from a citizen and it says, so what are you gonna do when they come across the Bayside Bridge and they dead in at um, Drew Street and yeah. back up all the way? And I'm like, you know, I've been thinking about that and it's something that we should have a discussion about. Yeah. Um, that then speaks to moving further up on yeah. McMullen Booth to East Lake Road that we probably do need to look at this corridor before that other project is complete in 2023-2024. So Whit and I did have that. We're yeah. thinking about some concepts like uh, tr transportation systems management and operations, yeah. um, looking at a range of maybe low impact operational <laughs> strategies there. Uh, you could look at a concept of reversible peak hour lanes, lanes. Exactly. Um, that I think could fit within the envelope of the existing right of way without creating a, a tall structure that residents adjacent to the corridor might object to. Um, that's my neighborhood, so I'm sensitive to that for sure. Um, but that's something that we would like to reach out and work with the uh, uh, county public works transportation folks to get them to bring some ideas forward. I know the county is looking at doing a vision for the East Lake corridor, and so it should be wrapped up in that vision, all of these. And that, that may not happen in a time frame within the adoption of our long range plan. So this may need to be something that we amend the plan later mm -hmm. and we keep the options open, uh, whether we lift the constraint now in the long range plan or lift the constraint later. So just kind of be aware that there's some other moving parts that aren't okay. neatly fitting into our long range plan adoption cycle. And we have to adopt the plan by November or else we get in trouble with the federal government. But I do, you're, you're, you're right about that. There are some other things besides lane additions that we can consider. Mm -hmm. And I think those are some of the some of the issues that we need to be putting, starting to put our hands around. And I don't really want to wait to, you know, till the other project is finished. This, we keep seeing all of the growth in Pasco County moving really towards the middle of the county. And it just, it's getting heavier and heavier coming into Pinellas. I mean, it's good they're coming for our jobs and such, but <laughs> our companies certainly need it. But um, but those that road is going to get I think even more and more crowded. So and during those critical hours, those th two hours two in, in the morning and in the evening, that's when it's really bad. Uh -huh. um, so if we can, you know, maybe there's some, you know, low hanging things that we can get that that, that can solve some of this problem. But uh, we definitely have a problem, and I don't want to wait. Um, and, well, as I recall, um, you know, we also. Um, and this is, came under the bus discussion back in 2003, you know, we do have the median mm -hmm. all the way up McMullen Booth through Eastlake, which right. offers us some unique opportunities. So. Yeah. One lane that can reverse. Exactly. And, so, and, and we, have light, in, what is it, light, what do you call it? Not interruption, but light. Progression? Uh, prior, prioritization. Oh, signal, pr yeah, pr signal prioritization. prioritization. Yeah, signal prioritization, yeah. So you can really get folks moving Mm -hmm. a little better but anyway the mayor did you have well you were talking about Pasco coming into Pinellas which we've known that's been happening for quite a while um, but then <coughs> it kind of leads you back to the conversation of US 19 going to Pasco and how they don't want to take it any further that's a different and we're talking about not taking it any further but yet we're gonna talk about East Lake. I'm just saying well, we have to handle the traffic that we have in Pinellas County. It oh, is yeah. what it is. And it is. We have the courage to do so. Right. Um, you know, another constrained road, which I was having a discussion with somebody about the other day, is Keystone. So 
Hillsboro has decided not to widen Keystone on their side of the equation. That creates problems within Pinellas, and yet they continue to build subdivisions along that corridor, which then right. creates issues. Well, that's why I brought it up. It was like, okay, so let's not forget, you know, so we are finishing US Let's continue 19. to have the courage to yeah. do what we need to do for our county. Right. Even though sometimes I've talked over the years that we ought to put a toll booth at the Pasco <laughs> Canal. And yeah. and yeah. We I mentioned it the other day to somebody. I said the commissioners would take turns manning the toll booth. Working, so, right. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, your point is good. So I just want to encourage you to um, kind of be a little patient because we are having some one-on-one -on -one conversations with the Pasco County commissioners. I've met with three of them. I've met with their staff, and I think they're willing to work with us. They've made some requests of us to work on some street and uh, trail connections mm -hmm. that would benefit them in our county. And I think if there's a little give on some things, then maybe they'll give on some other things and we might have a workable partnership. Particularly as we talk about the US 19 corridor, uh, there may be a way to get some of the workers in Pasco County um, and our northern county workers to job opportunities using transit too. And that should be part of the solution as we look at rebuilding US 19 North with an express um, transit option, whether that's with transit signal priority or whether it's with um, transit vehicles running on the shoulder or in a lane or as part of the intersection improvements that we're looking at. Doesn't that, uh, Commissioner Seal, doesn't that remind you of the park and rides we were going to do up there for Green Light for Pinellas? It, it all comes full circle. That would have been happening right this <laughs> second. These conversations do have a way of coming back. Yes, I do. Ms. Council Member Gabbard. So I just wanted to switch gears just a little bit and ask a question um, that comes to my mind for, you know, our transportation between St. Pete and Tampa on Gandhi um, and across the bridge there. So um, the actual last overpass there on the Brighton Bay light, um, do I understand that that is in design for 2024? Is that correct? It's, it's in the work program. Yeah, yeah. it is. And okay. it's 2024 <laughs> only because with the Howard Franklin Bridge replacement underway, right. we don't want to touch Gandhi until that one's done. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of questions about this from mm -hmm. people in my district moving from Hillsboro back to Southern Pinellas. Um, it's something that is very much needed to complete that eventual dream of being able to go from the Skyway to I-4 without any lights. It will be the last one. If you have driven over the Gandhi and seen the Tampa side, it is moving very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's going to be done very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know kind of where that would be in the ability to have another conversation about moving that up on the priority list. So the exciting news is that there is a Gandhi Bridge uh, PD&E study about to begin. Mm -hmm. We've been in scoping discussions with the Department of Transportation about that over the last month or two. Okay. And uh, that project is funded in FY20, so it'll get started sometime uh, later this year or okay. next year. And that will look at a lot of options in that corridor that will align what's happening on the Tampa side with what's happening in the Pinellas side. Right. And it'll also look at some trail connections in that area, which are there's some big gaps mm -hmm. that the county is, is working on. Okay. Um, so stay tuned for okay. that. Um, I think we may need that PD&E to really help us advance <coughs> the whole package right. of projects, but that interchange is certainly something we've identified as a high priority on our priority list. Yeah, there was a letter written, I think you wrote a letter in 2017, I think, that you know talked about that particular uh, overpass. So I just wanted to kind of bring that to you know the conversation today and see where we're at on it. Um, and I didn't know if part of that conversation had anything to do with, you know, the looming question about what's going to happen to the dog track they're at that intersection once you know December end of December comes and they don't have racing anymore that's part of the conversation yeah absolutely and from a land use standpoint we right. would be looking at that also the gateway master plan mm -hmm. is developing some recommendations that you'll see in the next month or two that will bring um, maybe some additional density of redevelopment in that area, and that's going to have an effect that we need to Absolutely. certainly be mindful of. And that's a longer-term uh, change that will happen to land use because that takes time too. Right. Um, so we're going to have a conversation in a moment about priorities, and maybe this is a good transition to that. But, you know, one 
reality is that our revenue sources at the state level and at the federal government level are declining. And that's because of the change in the fuel fleet uh, to more electric vehicles and more fuel efficient vehicles. And it's starting to have an impact on the work program, um, not just because of the hurricane effects, but because of the declining major source of revenue of how we get transportation projects done. So I, unless we make a change to that somehow, I predict in the next five to seven years or even in the next two to three years, you're going to see fewer projects funded in your work program. And it's just a heads up. So we want to keep these things that are in the program, in the program. We don't want to see deferrals out, but it's going to get harder to move things into the work program. And that's just the reality of the constraints we're dealing with, unless we are enabled to come up with our own revenue sources, uh, which is part of the equation. And um, you know, I'm not advocating for that, but I think that's got to be a part of the conversation if we're getting less and less at the federal and state level. There is also a federal reauthorization of the highway bill or transportation um, authorization that's going to be about a year and a half out if they can get it done on time. So that could pretend some big changes at the federal government level. OK. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Um, Mayor? Uh, same page that you're on now, The what looks like here, brown, is the constrained, mm -hmm. the teal colored ones. Mm -hmm. Are those to be constrained no, in the future? No, those are the ones that are saying those are not constrained in any way, shape, or form. Okay. And then all other roadways in Pinellas County, we expect n they will not be widened in the future, but they are not officially constrained. Okay. Um, the, I, I'm seeing a, the center portion of US 19 from the Largo Clearwater area going all the way down through to St. Pete mm -hmm. that's not on that not constrained Correct, because there's no widening planned in that area. I do know that the PD&E is underway on the Gandy Interchange, and that uh, PD&E so far has recommended turn lane improvements and other things that would not interfere with that at all. Well, and then the reason why I'm asking, too, when we were talking about Northern County, where you get so far and then there's no improvements and you get it to a stop, that's going to happen, you know, driving south on US-19, um, leaving the Lillman area and going into the St. Pete area. You're going to have a create a bottleneck if you're doing improvements all along, and then boom, you stop. No more improvements, whether it's widening or turn lanes or light pattern consistencies or or what have you. So, so one I, thing I was just kind of concerned about right. our additional the one that we've relied on forever north south sure. travel. So US 19 is a is a is an interesting challenge um, and. What I would say about that middle section is that, uh, according to the PD&E study, the city of Pinellas Park has still been opposed to uh, the overpasses north of Gandhi Park Boulevard, mm -hmm. like at Mainlands, for instance, and the Walmart. Um, so they're not planning any grade separations through there. It's also going to be tough to widen that road through that mm -hmm. section because of the new apartment complexes and other things that are going through there. So I think that's still more of an operational strategy. But bear in mind that uh, we are advancing, working with the Department of Transportation to get the I-275 capacity and lane continuity improvements completed that would tie in with the Howard Franklin Bridge. So really, anybody going a longer distance should be getting on the interstate for a longer distance trip. Could have, would have, should have. Well, no, I mean, that's, that's going to happen in the next four or five years. No, no I'm saying they, you, we want them to, we encourage them to, yeah, but be do they? Too. And the Gateway Expressway project, which will link yeah. 19 directly to 275, I think will shift significant amounts of traffic away from 19. So let's kind of see how that begins to play out, but just keep those projects in mind. They, are, they all work as a system, and uh, we've got to kind of keep that together. But I, I think your points are valid. I mean, we don't want to create bottlenecks in the system. Any other questions for Chelsea? I, I have one. Yes, Commissioner. Um, that brown road that goes across the middle of the county is Almerton. Almerton. That's what I thought. Yes. So are you mm -hmm. saying that that Howard Franklin connection is not constrained? Well, it's constrained all the way from I-275 over the entire corridor. Uh, the MPO board took action, I believe, in the 90s when the PD&E was underway for Omelton Road. Uh, it was considering grade separation, uh, and the MPO said that they were opposed to grade separation and did not want that facility widened beyond the three lanes that had been planned. But it's not showing constraint. It's in blue. No. 
this part's constrained. Right. Yeah. Oh, she's talking about from I'm talking there about over. the bridge. Yeah. Oh, the bridge is not constrained. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Oh, I'm sorry. So it, it turns into Walsingham. Is that what you're No, she's talking Walsingham. about the Howard Franklin. It's constrained oh. right now, but it's under no, it's TD and E. It's a non No, the Howard Franklin is not constrained, the blue. Because it's being replaced. Yeah, but not soon enough. <laughs> it's, it's underway. I know it is what it is, <laughs> but oh my gosh, it's awful. <laughs> that's that's our biggest, I believe, critic, and I I think everybody will agree that the citizens don't feel like that we plan far enough out to address things as they're going. That our visions don't always match up with what's happening on a planning level versus what's happening on the roads. In real life. And yeah. Well, I will just say I'll defend the department a little bit. We're here. trying. Bridges are extremely expensive to replace, yeah. and it takes a lot to get those resources together. But the good news is it's underway. There's a plan developed, and it's a design build project. Is that right? So that's that's the expedited method of getting a project built. Well, and, and that's the reason why I say we're trying because we have done vision here where we have MPO and PPC merged together. Well, to and the department's a great partner. Uh, they've got some bigger challenges on the Hillsborough County side where there's still some debate about how to go forward with some of those, um, like downtown interchange in Tampa, and that's going to get worked out. But it's, you know, it's complex. And, uh, and we've all said the number one priority in the region is the West Shore interchange at, at 275, and there is a, um, uh, there is a sort of a short-term quick fix to punch through an additional travel lane in each direction. That'll help a lot, uh, but the ultimate uh, interchange improvement is not yet funded in the work program, and that's what we're working on. So, yeah, we, we get it. We understand. And the citizens are right. It's uh, long overdue. All right. Let's, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the, uh, the, some annual priorities we have, three different ones. So that you want yeah, to... I'll introduce this and let Chelsea get as far as she can through it. <laughs> um, this is uh, a preview. We're not asking for any action today. Uh, but every year, we adopt priorities to tell the Florida Department of Transportation what Pinellas County prefers uh, and wishes to see happen in terms of the new five-year work program. So think about it. Um, this is a five-year capital improvement program. The uh, first several years are set, so we're talking about the new fifth year of the work program. We might get something inserted earlier, like a study or a low-cost project, but generally speaking, a major capital project will be in the new fifth year. Take it away. All right, so no PowerPoint for this, but I'm going to walk you through what's in your packet, the priority list. Uh, just as a reminder, we do keep projects on the list until they are completed, and just in case additional funding is needed or anything like that. So at the top of the, you'll see the proposed priority number is actually a P, that's just for program. Uh, so walking through the changes on that, we are removing the Gateway Mid-County Mid Master Plan from the list. Uh, this project will be completed within the next couple of months. So it no longer needs to be on the list. So, so that one's we've lost the feed because it's not coming up on our. No, no, she's. Oh, said it's it not on your screen. Here. It's just in your packet. Do you want to put that on the little? My notes are on it, so I apologize. Uh. <laughs> um, so that one is being removed from the priority list, um, and then uh, DOT uh, has programmed nine of our priorities for funding uh, with the next work program. So those are moved up and highlighted. Uh, there's US 19 from 54th Avenue South to 22nd Avenue North. That's the complete streets project. Sorry, it should be 22nd Avenue South. Um, the Oldsmar Complete Streets Project on St. Petersburg Drive. The Largo Complete Streets Project on Rosary Road. Uh, the Alt-19, uh, that's a turn lane uh, south of Curlew Place. Um, the St. Petersburg Greater Downtown Area Network Alternatives Analysis. Uh, it's a traffic study in downtown St. Petersburg. Uh, the funding for that was programmed. Uh, the Harn Boulevard Overpass. Um, the Lane Continuity and Express Lanes projects on I-275 from 54th Ave South to south of Roosevelt. And then two of the gaps uh, in the Pinellas Trail Loop in the South Gap. Those have been advanced for construction as well. So those are moving up in your priority list. Uh, moving to the unfunded portion of the priority list. Um, just as a reminder, anything that we want off the top, we always have to put very close to the top of the list so that DOT knows to program those first. Uh, so the first one that you'll see, actually the first two, uh, that's planning funding that we use uh, um, in our agency and also in coordination with uh, the Florida Department of Transportation to do planning studies. Uh, so you'll see those at the top. Um, and then numbers three and four. Uh, number three is the Complete Streets Project in St. Petersburg that this board awarded funding for at your meeting, I believe, two months ago. Uh, number four, um, we are recommending up to $1.5 million of capital funding for PSTA bus replacements. Uh, that's also why it's at the top of the list. 
Um, the next changes, if you move down uh, number nine, we actually struck through, so there's new number nine. Uh, that is uh, US-19 Transit Corridor Investments. Um, so we would be looking for capital funding uh, for um, basically just corridor investments to uh, support regional um, express transit service uh, in the US-19 corridor from roughly the Eckerd College area into the Gateway area. Um, other changes to the priority list. And why is that being eliminated? Oh, oh, we had one extra on there, sorry. So the, you're the asking that, about the US-19 North yeah, the gateway the, to. There was a gateway to Newport Ritchie that we had talked about Newport in the prior Ritchie. draft. Okay, right. The uh, the reason for that is because I want to have um, more time to build some coordination with Pasco County on that project. I think that if we're going to have an express transit project between Pasco and Pinellas County, there should be some shared participation if we can at all achieve that. And I'd like Pasco to also put that on their priority list together with us and make a joint request to the department, okay. we're going to have a much better chance of getting funding if we do it that way. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, the 34th Street South segment that Chelsea mentioned, which is the new number nine, I guess, on here, mm -hmm. that coincides with our 34th Street South mm -hmm. uh, Complete Streets grant that we awarded to the city of St. Petersburg a couple of three years ago. We've completed that study. We had the public workshop last week. And... Um, you know, that's, that's an opportunity um, to really develop a, a connection between um, lower and moderate income households and workforce job training opportunities. Uh, and it's a quarter that uh, is going to redevelop and evolve over time. And the Skyway Marina District has been a big partner in pushing for that. Right. So That's the Skyway District. Yeah. So that's one that we see as uh, maybe a, a, a near-term transit uh, improvement project. Okay. All right, and then moving through the priority list, other changes that we are recommending. Um, number 15, we just changed the project limit on that for the 126th Avenue project. Uh, we were just updating it to match the PD&E that's currently underway by Pinellas County. Uh, we are recommending removing the Waterborne Transportation Capital Grant uh, request. Uh, we've had this on the priority list for a couple of years now, and given the limitations to our funding sources, we've been unable to fund that program this way. Uh, so we'd like to kind of take a step back and try to find another way to provide that funding outside of this adopted priority list because it's just not working out for us. That may be something that's better suited for a conversation with the Tourist Development Council as maybe seed funding, not the whole thing, but seed funding that could be matched with state funding. But we need to have that conversation. So since this has been in the budget, so how have we tried to pursue it? We, we have tried to pursue it through uh, working with our legislative delegation. We've tried to pursue it, pursue it through our priority list. The, the challenge with going through the FDOT process for transit grants is that you have to have a local match. Mm -hmm. And so we need to know where that local match will come from. And thus far, it hasn't come from mm -hmm. City of Clearwater or Pinellas County. And we don't have the funds for local match. So that's... I'm open to suggestions on that. Okay. You have a question from Mayor Pachowski? Well, I just want to add to that conversation. I mean, I definitely think it's important. And I also think that um, it would be great, at least, I mean, I know there's all kinds of waterborne <coughs> transportation opportunities, large and small, but for the smaller ones, let's say, um, it, I think it's really important for, for them and the Jolly Charlie to have some type of... Um, coordination where you can one ticket kind of use where you get on a PSTA bus or a Jolly Charlie or a ferry to get where you're going right. Um, and right now that's not even possible so to me that needs to be pursued that's, heavily that's a great suggestion so uh, we agree with you and I will just say one thing because we don't have a local match and we don't have a local sponsor we're also missing out on federal notice of funding opportunities that there was just one for waterborne transportation, but the the private operator is not eligible to go after that. So that does require partnership either with Tuvarda or with PSTA in our county. So, may I? Yes, Commissioner. Um, I think it would be worth a discussion. I'm not sure who the person is. Maybe you went to talk to Mayor Kreisman and um, ask him how he managed to get. The those grants that he did from the feds for the trolley in downtown St. Pete, and maybe Clearwater and um, the trolley service in Clearwater could do the, could kind of use the same model. Those would be conversations with PSTA, but those are certainly things we can certainly have a conversation about. That's 
Absolutely. It does take a partnership to do these things. It does, and I do think there might be a role for TBARTA to take as well, given that we have thus far managed to hold our funding solid in the legislature to be funneled through TBARTA out to some projects that are on the drawing board in the region, this could potentially be one of them. Good suggestion. So moving down uh, the priority list, uh, numbers 23, 24, and 25 are also proposed additions. Uh, we have Gulf Boulevard sidewalk improvements from Indian Shores to Indian Rocks Beach. Uh, this was an item of discussion at your meeting last month, and it will be ba brought back, I believe, at your next meeting uh, for further discussion as well. Um, number 24 is a cycle track on St. Pete Beach. Um, there aren't a lot of details on this one because we're still working it out, um, but when this comes back to you for final approval, we will have more information um, on that project as well. I can just say something. This is being done in conjunction with the undergrounding of utilities, uh, in, and it's another partnership opportunity with the city of St. Pete Beach. So um, we're working with the Department of Transportation to see if we can get that done as expeditiously as possible. And number tw 25 is an aerial transit feasibility and operations plan, and we're looking at that for the downtowns of St. Petersburg and Clearwater. And then uh, what would be uh, the new 25, if not listed, is a, a funding for an intermodal center in the city of Clearwater. Um, so again, this is just draft right now. Uh, it will be brought back uh, for action at a later date, but we wanted the opportunity to present this to you and get your comments. If I can say something about the intermodal center, um, how many of you know the Park Street Terminal um, here in downtown Clearwater? I encourage you one of these days to take a walk over there. It's, it's by the Flag Building and uh, it's just south of Cleveland Street. Uh, it is, well, I started working for PSTA in 1989 or 1990 and it was old and decrepit then. So it, it and it, they can't fit their new buses in there uh, because of the roof overhang. Um, it doesn't have capacity. It's got a lot of challenges. So PSTA has had this on the list for a couple of decades, I think. They do not have the, um, all the necessarily funding, funding lined up, so we want to get it on the priority list so that we could maybe look at a state match to a federal grant um, and uh, maybe working with the city of Clearwater and the county on, um, as we move forward with joint development of office space, for instance, maybe that could be part of that conversation. Um, Councilmember all Britain, is there something you want to add? To well, that? I just wanted to say, or a relocation of that to our transit center on the corner of uh, Court and Myrtle, because that's been kind of that's the concept is that it wouldn't stay in that location, right. but it would we would find a new site for that intermodal center in downtown. So, thank you for pointing. I out. think conversations have already started with City of Clearwater and PSTA about that site and planning because PSTA does have the money for planning right now, right? But just not the money for building. So. I think it's 10 million or 20 million, if I remember right. I mean, it's it's not a cheap project. Mm -hmm. 20 million, thank you. Okay, and uh, for the the transit feasibility operations plan, uh, we are scoping that currently. We will bring back a scope to you as soon as that scope is developed. Uh, but we're putting it on the list because that's something that if we wanted the Florida Department of Transportation to contribute to, we need to get it on a list. But it wouldn't be a full funding with FDOT. We'd probably have to find some other funding sources. No more comments on multimodal? All right, we'll move into the Transportation Alternatives Program priority list. Uh, the Transportation Alternatives is a grant funding program for uh, basically bicycle and pedestrian projects. Um, so we have um, one project that has been completed in the city of St. Petersburg. Um, it was a Pinellas Trail extension landscaping. Uh, so that project is right here, and that is being proposed to be removed from the list. Other changes include uh, the addition of two projects up here to the program section of the priority list. We did advance uh, two transportation alternatives uh, projects with this next work program. Uh, there are sidewalks on 42nd Avenue in the Wellman community and also a 71st Street trail connector uh, to the Pinellas Trail uh, in St. Petersburg. So those are now funded, so those are moving up. Um, other changes to the list include removing those two projects from the priority list since they moved up. And then also removing a couple of other projects. Um, one in the city of Gulfport, the city uh, was no longer looking to pursue that project, so it is being removed. Uh, and another one, uh, their multi use trails phase four, uh, it's been completed um, with a different funding source. So that's coming off the list at the time, uh, as well as some Pinellas Trail Loop projects that have now been funded. So those will be removed from the list. We are working uh, with your uh, committees right now to overhaul. 
how we um, accept applications and prioritize projects for this funding source, and that'll be brought back to you at a future date as well. So let's see if you have any questions on the TA program. I, I have. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Um, sure. When those projects are removed uh, mm -hmm. for funding because they found another source, mm -hmm. it goes back into this project? Yeah, yeah, we'll just take it off the list. Just mm -hmm. so it doesn't basically free up any money, it just... Well, D DOT looks at this uh, list every year, and it's a very small pot of money, so usually they can only advance one or two projects. These projects didn't have any funding on them yet. So they were completed with another funding source, so it just makes another project eligible for funding. Okay. We get about, what, three to four million on average per year? Roughly. In transportation alternatives, and that doesn't really go very far in say a trail or a sidewalk project even. I have seen sidewalk projects that are multiple million dollars for just a mile of sidewalk. So just, it's a, it's a very limited source. We, it's a funding source that comes to the region and then it's shared among the three counties because we're one urbanized area. And that's also why we're looking to overhaul the program because a lot of these projects have been on the list for years. Some of them aren't even eligible anymore. Um, it's a very small pot of money, so if uh, prices go up on the cost of construction, they might be too much money even to be funded with this program. Um, so when we bring back program revisions, we're hoping to address that. And there are, um, the other reason that projects like this are very expensive is because of utilities and utility relocations that have to occur. And um, there's a, um, a rule that no more than a certain percentage of the project cost can be spent on things like utilities and utility relocation. So that if you've got a lot of that going on, uh, you've got some challenges. So on Gulf Boulevard, for instance, where we're trying to get a sidewalk built and de deal with some drainage issues, Pinellas County is contributing $8 million just for utility relocations. And the department is contributing $6 million for the drainage project. So sometimes they can get really out of whack with what you're really trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So what's the oldest project on here that you have that obviously inflation will affect? Well, all of these projects came from 2010, so okay. yeah. There are a couple that were substituted about four years ago where local governments kind of swapped out projects, um, but most are from 2010. We're going to have a much more robust conversation about the new Transportation Alternatives Program. Next month. Next month. Yes. Are you sure next month? Yep. Okay. We're going to have a busy month next month. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, get your sleep right? the night before. On the, uh, on the Pinellas County trails um, yeah, you had uh, Duke Energy Trail North Gap and then phase one and two mm -hmm. uh, phase one isn't that one's complete right or is that one that one's finished some of the project descriptions are changing as well I know that uh, Pinellas County recently broke the self gap into its own individual phases I believe the old phase one was the North Gap um, so yeah this is uh, now phases three four and five and four was advanced for funding I believe Okay, well, I don't know how they're labeled now, yeah. but that, that part is finished. Yeah. Correct, yeah. the and north. Then, mm -hmm. And then the north gap, um, we're, we're, have, we're gonna have some continuing conversations. So mm -hmm. when is this supposed to be approved? That this uh, we will approve this at your June meeting. Okay, mm -hmm. so stay, we're gonna have some more conversation on that because I think we're, well, there were some concerns raised yesterday in our meeting about mm -hmm. safety issues relating to crossing some of our major thoroughfares. So. Yes. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right. Your next priority list. Um, the Transportation Management Area Leadership Group every year uh, adopts a list of priorities for consensus, and then that list of priorities is brought to each MPO for them to approve. Um, they actually approved this list at their meeting last week. However, we're not actually acting you, asking you to take action today. I just wanted to let you know what they uh, made decisions on. Uh, so again, the TMA also keeps their funded priorities on the list. So you see the Howard Franklin, Gateway Express, and then some interchange projects and the express lines on I-275 in Pinellas County. Uh, so for next year, the top priorities for the Tampa Bay region include the I-275 State Road 60 West Shore Interchange, uh, I-75 interchanges at Gibsonton Road and at Overpass Road. Overpass Road is up in Pasco County. Uh, Central Ave Bus Rapid <coughs> Transit and then operational improvements on I-275 north of downtown Tampa. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, um, on the express lanes from I-375 to I-275, mm -hmm. uh, what was the original rationale to not take that all the way to 175? Do we know? 
Anybody have that information? For the managed lanes? Uh, the express lanes. The express lanes, yeah. right. Managed lanes, express lanes. Okay. I think the idea was to bring them down to 375 is the first. I mean, it's basically to save money, um, okay. you know, because you're not going as far and you're not going through that big cluster of an interchange. Well, that's kind of know. the whole point of you're getting needing two. to do it. Well, you're getting to 375, which provides the access. Also, we know that there are some operational challenges with people backing up coming into St. Peter on 175 mm -hmm. in the morning. Right. The department is committed to looking at uh, solutions to that as part oh, okay. of the lane continuity okay. uh, project. So it'll happen. I just think from a managed lane standpoint, Got it. Um, it would be far more challenging and costly to bring it to 175 when you've got the east-west connection north of downtown. But they are looking at that 375 to 175. Oh, that'll be part of the lane continuity. Okay. Just not for the managed lanes. Got it. Okay. Right, right. now. And, you know, it's subject to change because we're going through the PD&E, but that's yeah. kind of where we are now. Yeah, because that just gets such a bottleneck right through there that anything that can be done to kind of ease that burden would be. So what I've been telling folks is that, um, you know, with the 34th Street Complete Streets project, and, you know, we had an open house, and there was a there's going to be in the story in the paper tomorrow about um, this complete streets issue. Um, we wouldn't probably be considering that project the way we're considering it if we didn't know the I-275 quarter improvements were coming and in the work program. And, and I think it's just a good complementary set of high speed, this is where you want to be, lower speed, that's where you want to be. Right. Uh, and where are, you, where are you going to have redevelopment? It's not going to be on I-275. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in the 34th Street corridor. So they, they work together, um, and we're confident that we're going to get a good solution out of that. We're also confident that the department's going to do everything it can to minimize right-of-way uh, takes and impacts as they look at the 275 corridor. If they have right-of-way needs, it'll likely come from ponds for drainage, mm -hmm. uh, and they're looking within the right-of-way first and um, have been working cooperatively with the city and the county on uh, figuring out where potential drainage ponds locations could be where right of way could be acquired. Um, so at least the cities and the counties are helping guide that discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay. And then the last priority list uh, was a, also a TMA. Uh, they took action on their 2019 top priorities for multi-use trails. This list remains unchanged from last year, uh, save for some updated project descriptions. So it includes the Duke Energy Trail in Pinellas, the Starkey Trail Connector um, in uh, Pasco County, the South Coast Greenway in Hillsboro, uh, the Bypass Canal Trail in Hillsborough, and the Orange Belt Trail in Pasco counties as well. And I'll answer any questions that you may have on any this. Any final questions? Thank you. Thank you. I feel, feel better. better. Yeah. <laughs> so again, this will be a vote in at She's your June trooper. meeting. <laughs> okay. We'll move on to um, Skinner Boulevard Complete Streets Project. Uh, Okay, I'll introduce this, and, and Bob, uh, Iron Smith is here from the city of Dunedin, and uh, uh, we really like this project a lot, uh, and Bob, thank you for being here today, and I Certainly. think it's just an example of another cooperative working relationship between our agency and a local government and the state of Florida, because it, we're all three involved in all this. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate Ford Pinellas, $100,000 grant, really allowed <coughs> us to do a lot of public participation and really uh, work with the community and work with our partners. Uh, Skinner Boulevard is uh, we're looking for changes from all 19 to Bass. This is part of the complete streets. We're looking at doing safety, uh, multimodal, uh, Pinellas Trail uh, safety and connection, golf cart crossing, which we've just been very successful up in Tallahassee to get some approval from DOT to do a crossing there at Bass, something that was long awaited that our mayor certainly was pushing through as well other commissioners. Commissioner Gracie was up there in, in, in Tallahassee. So we're very excited about it. And uh, this is something where uh, currently today Skinner Boulevard bifurcates our downtown. It's in our redevelopment district. It's kind of moving traffic quickly, but we certainly have uh, safety issues out there and other aspects that are not allowing this corridor to transform, and we think it can be a lot more. Uh, George F. Young has done the preliminary designs for us. I have uh, uh, Chris Bridges here and Mike Schofield. Uh, Jerry Dipkowski has been our lead. Uh, Jerry had some medical leave, couldn't be here unfortunately today. But uh, we've gone through, as I say, this really uh, strong uh, public participation process. And what's been interesting with it is, you know, typically a consultant makes a presentation and you have maybe 25% of the questions. This has been the opposite. It's been 75% questions <laughs> and kind of the 25% on the presentation and a lot of good questions. So 
But we have a, a PowerPoint with, which Chris is going to go through uh, with you, showing concept number three. We had three concepts, and uh, we had a no build, and then we had uh, a little lane modification, and then we have two traffic circles or roundabouts in concept three. And this is what uh, the public really, uh, really wanted to see. And we also went to our commission, and they also uh, gave us approval to go forward with it. So Chris, I guess, is going to take it from here. I think we have Welcome a little PowerPoint. Okay. Welcome, Chris. All right. Thank you, Board. I can help you there. Uh, I guess uh, advances to the left or the right. Yep, you got it. I'm seeing you. There we here, go. So. All right. Good afternoon, Board. Again, Chris Bridges with George F. Young. I've got a couple of colleagues with me, Michael Schofield and Doug Calderon. Uh, this is a presentation, as Bob alluded to, on making over or transforming a section of State Road 580 into a complete street. Um, State Road 580 extends all the way out to Oldsmar. Um, the project that we're looking at and focusing on is in Dunedin, uh, at the far western end of 580 at Alt 19, and then extending to the east to Bass Boulevard. You may also know as where Main Street peels off of State Road 580 and heads south and west into the heart of downtown Dunedin. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you again for the grant, as Bob alluded to. Uh, on the left is the cover letter from Mayor Bujelski to the, to the, um, to the board requesting uh, the grant or, or accompanying the grant application request. And then on the right is the, uh, a glimpse of what constitutes or goes into complete streets, as you're well aware. They don't just address motorists, but it accommodates other users namely cyclists and pedestrians and transit. And as Bob alluded to, I think it's time we add a fifth uh, spoke to that wheel, fifth slice of pie, if you will. Um, Florida is an emerging state where a population um, prefers golf carts as a mode of transportation. And can applaud the DOT, who's long maintained that uh, we won't have golf carts on our roads, nor will we have them crossing our streets. Um, they recognize they need to evolve. It's just the reality. People are going to cross their streets, use their streets. Um, it'll still be on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but they recognize that golf carts is big in, in the community of Dinita, and so I should give them some uh, kudos. Again, let's reach out to our other stakeholders, um, Forward Pinellas, City of Dinita and staff, thank you, FDOT, Pinellas County, and uh, PSTA. Just some numbers on this section of 580, also known as Skinner Boulevard, to the locals in Dunedin. This, the takeaway from this slide is that the, uh, uh, the, the volume of traffic has, for the past decade, largely remained the same. And we can anticipate going forward it will stay about the same. Crash statistics. Uh, just in four years, from 2014 through 2018, 70 reported. Um, traffic accidents involving automobiles. Additionally, 10, eight of which involved cyclists and two that involved uh, pedestrians. Again, just some kudos to the DOT for recognizing that um, communities are unique. They have their own needs. They recognize that DOT, uh, or that the city of Dunedin has golf cart users, and it's a, 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 one of their preferred, preferred modes of transportation. So. So our schedule, we're on schedule. We want to wrap up our study at <laughs> the end of um, next month. Um, we're on, on, right on schedule. And so some of the concepts that emerge from the numerous workshops and presentations, uh, as uh, Bob alluded to, the first is a no-build. We thought, well, maybe there's some folks out there that love the way it operates. They love it. It's not broke. Don't fix it, um, which let me back up. It's a five-lane section, two lanes in each direction. It's got opposing left-turn lanes down the middle, curb and gutter, sidewalks on either side. It's got a light at either end at Skinner and one at Alt 19. Surprisingly, nobody said, leave it alone. Everyone wanted some change to it. So let's see. This is at the, uh, previously that was at the eastern end at the light at, at Bass. and at the western end, adjacent to uh, the Pinellas Trail. In concept two, we reduced the lane in each direction. 
that affords room for a bike, uh, bike lane, some on-street parking, bus bays. In the medians, we were able to uh, provide some grass or landscaping where appropriate, where um, it made sense. Um, we recognize that all pedestrians are not going to cross at the light, so we've added a couple of mid-block crossings to accommodate pedestrians. That's at the east end, and then at the west end. We tie back to a uh, five-lane section at either end, so it remains five lanes at either end. Um, third concept is exactly like ex concept two, except we introduce roundabouts at both uh, Douglas and at Highland. So, bird's eye view, with either concept, this is the section we're looking at. A one lane in each direction, bike lanes, on-street parking, bus bays, landscape median, and at PSTA's request, we've left the lane at 12 feet, 12 feet wide lanes. Yeah, I just want to add something sure. here too real quickly. Yeah, the, uh, the traffic circles, we've met with all the major stakeholders out there too. I think it's important to, to, to mention that. The Coca-Cola, the hospital, the Meese Manor, all, all the major players, because our fire department, you know, obviously a traffic circle can give you a little bit of pause, but the way this has been designed by, by George F. Young and, and, and Jerry Dukowski is it has concrete aprons, it has a very wide uh, circular circumference to allow for that movement to facilitate. So the other thing to mention too, these are one lane traffic circles <coughs> with very defined access points. This is way different, and as Chris mentioned on the volume, we're just under 12,000. This is not a 45,000 trip a day type traffic circle. It's a way different animal. I just wanted to make sure to emphasize that because I know people, you typically mention it and wow, people pause. That's just not the situation. So, excuse me, Chris. Just want to get no, up. thanks for clarifying that. A single lane roundabout at each of those intersections. Have you looked at naming rights for that? <laughs> uh, let's talk it. afterwards. Yeah. Let's talk. <laughs> at least two right here, right? Yeah. So if you just want to take a second, these are all the folks that we met face to face and talked with. If you want to just peruse that. Again, Bob mentioned Coca-Cola. They've got a facility. They've got to get their trucks. Uh, they're on Douglas. They've got to get yep. their trucks through those roundabouts. Or MLK. Yep. MLK. Or MLK. I'm sorry. Up at the upper right, it'll mention we had three public workshops attended by over 150 folks. The two slides in the middle are from the workshop. We also had a walkabout on December 1st, attended yes. by about 50 people, where we actually walked the corridor and looked at the concepts and looked at maybe try to identify any pitfalls and at the same time maybe some opportunities to improve on those concepts. At the first workshop, we asked those in attendance, we gave them 13 items and asked them to rank them in in, uh, in order of importance or priority, five being a priority, one being of low priority. The four top four respondents were the golf cart crossings, the lighting, the mid-block crossings, and the roundabouts, all of, that, all of which are addressed with concept number three. Yeah, they, they, I just want to mention, too, that golf cart crossing. Jerry Dipkowski is not here, but he was the key going up to Tallahassee, talking about the signal movement there at Bass with uh, – with Commissioner Gracie and all the commission um, a commitment to it, as well as our public works director, uh, Jorge Quintus, uh, got this done. It's really remarkable to get a variance from DOT for it. So I just, I just want to really reemphasize that. The golf cart was something that continued to come up during the public participation process. And well should it. Uh, this is a little hard to read, but um, what I take away from it is that the second workshop, we looked at some hybrids of the three. We didn't just want to make it clear, we didn't just look at, well, two alternatives. We looked at hybrids of a number of yes. So, At the bottom, at the third and final workshop, we actually presented to those in attendance concept number three, and we just asked them point blank, do you support it, do you not support it? Uh, there were 30 folks there in attendance, I guess 15, were, they were all couples, mm -hmm. or uh, 34, 17 couples, and uh, 15 of the couples appro approved of concept number three. So moving forward, we met last month with the mayor and the uh, city's commission, <laughs> had a workshop. Uh, we're here today. 
Uh, we're going to uh, draft the report um, shortly, and we want to finalize it in May. So we're here before you today to ask for your support. Um, recommendation that loop concept number three, namely with the one lane in each direction, the bike lanes, the on-street parking, the bus bays, and then the roundabouts at both Highland and Douglas be moved forward. And here to answer any questions that you might have. And just to clarify, we don't have this as an action item if the board wishes oh, no. to send a okay. message. And, okay. And our, our ignorance is. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, we just listed it as an informational okay. item. Uh, but if the board wishes to endorse this project or a concept, then feel free. Um, but the way I kind of look at it is if you come back for funding at some point in the future, and we grant you funding, that's sort of a tacit <laughs> endorsement, right? We, are, we will do that next year. Which certainly. is where Claire's going. I think to get, the, to get a you know, good feedback, especially yeah. if it's yeah. negative, would be important yeah. to get that now. So Yeah, and I'll, Commissioner Seal. If I can just add something real quick, uh, this is a state highway. The Department of Transportation does have a State Road 580 corridor study funded in the FY20 work program, so that'll be commencing. And what they're going to be looking at is not duplicating this effort, but just looking at how this project might transition going east, uh, and then not necessarily looking at lane reductions going east, but just looking at other safety and mobility strategies uh, for the whole corridor. So uh, since it is a state road, um, you know, they are going through a process of a lane elimination feasibility analysis. Uh, that's being wrapped up as part of this project. Um, you know, Richard, I don't know if the department needs Ford Pinellas to formally endorse a recommendation at this time, but at certain point, you know, before you get going, you might need that. So is we'll, the, we'll take your lead on that. Is, is the merger going to be, uh, the merged lane going to happen east or west of Bass? Or, or do you know? I'll let them answer. I don't know if I know the I, answer. I think most of it's going to happen west of Bass, but there'll be some transition to the to the east, too, getting people. I think that's what the Jerry had in that plan. Unless, Michael, do you yeah. know any different? Come uh, on, Mike. Come on. Come on. Uh, Michael with George F. Young also has worked Michael. very hard on this project. Uh, the uh, the uh, transition to merge west of Bass and Maine. Uh, that's the, okay. Um, so you'll go through that. You'll go through. You would Bass go. You would go through the signal lanes. at Bass, two lanes, and reduce to one. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah, but there is. A, Thank there, you. There is a, a good queuing lane for the gateway. We obviously know that project is set for redevelopment. Yep. Something yep. we're working on right now, frankly, with the, with the commission and the mayor. So the gateway will have its own pretty uh, long queuing lane. Can you talk a little bit about what the gateway project will entail? Yeah, sure. I, I, you know, we actually are looking at a workshop here very shortly, but the preliminary discussion have been uh, apartments, uh, 90, 95 apartments thereabout. Uh, we're looking at a food hall type concept, and we're looking at uh, retail. We've even looked at uh, some type of event space, if that could be a good fit. So everything is kind of up in the air a little bit, but we know the apartment the retail and the food hall have kind of been the constants over last time. And if you've seen the food hall down on uh, Franklin Street down Tampa, which is just a little bit uh, five minutes from your armature, we're looking at that type of concept. Any other questions? Did you have? Yeah. Just a comment. Oh boy. Okay, I am really sorry, but uh -oh. <clears throat> I travel this corridor a lot, sure. and I know how. Um, everyone's been so concerned at the Pinellas Trail. Mm -hmm. And I was just in St. Petersburg yesterday near Coffee Pot Bayou and used a roundabout there. Mm -hmm. No one used it properly. Mm -hmm. They ran right over the roundabout. They didn't know where to turn. They didn't know how to treat it. And I am really concerned about putting a roundabout this close to the trail because they're going to be worried about how they transverse the roundabout, and then suddenly they're going to have the trail right in front of them. And I have seen it in Bel Air. I have seen it in Clearwater Beach. I am familiar with roundabouts. Sure. I understand they are used multiple places, but being so close to a heavily used trail, um, with people trying to figure it out just really, really bothers me. So I, oh, I, I mean. You, you really think you're talking about the Douglas. Uh, I'm talking about the Douglas one. Yeah, the as Douglas opposed one. to the Correct. Highland. The Martin Luther King doesn't bother me as much. I'm 
really worried about this being so close to the trail. Well, let me uh, I appreciate the input. Let me take it back with George F. Young, and we'll take a look and study that mm -hmm. and see what the thoughts are. Unless Chris well, what I can it, offer is uh, the, the posted speed out there right now is between 30 and 40. The intent of the roundabout is to get the traffic down in the 15-mile-an-hour range. Now I, know I, I get it, but I, they don't know how to use it. And it's we, just we could tighten up the radius so that they're going to not be able to. And if you it's, if you put in the ra the traffic apron is somewhat raised, you could raise it more to discourage people because now it becomes like a speed hump or whatnot. Yeah, I just, and <laughs> as they come out of the roundabout, I mean they should be doing about fifteen. And you're correct, slowing. but they're coming out of the roundabout and they're going to hit the trail and they're going to be like, oh. Here we are. I've got I've got to now stop, or I've got to worry about these pedestrians. Well, we'll, Bingo. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at it. And, and we have been working yeah. very closely with DOT too. I can tell you, DOT is definitely more in the traffic circle roundabout mode than they've ever been. So but we we can study. Please it. go out, so. test, see the one in St. Pete, look at the one in Bel Air on sure. Indian Rocks Road, and I think you'll see what I'm concerned about. Okay. It, it, and it's maybe if we get. A hundred of a hundred of them in Pinellas County, people will get how to use them. Yeah. But right well, now, they don't get how to use them, and I just think yeah. we're creating a more dangerous situation. Uh, look, I, I appreciate your input. We'll take a look at it, and, and I'm glad you're not looking at the one at Clearwater Beach because that's like. Night, I mean, no, I'm glad you're not mentioning the one at Clearwater Beach because that one's got. 40, oh, I did mention that one, but, yeah, that, but that's, that one, that's a different scenario. Yeah, that one's got forty-five thousand trips a day. Mm -hmm. Not even close to what we're looking at, but we can look at the other ones you mentioned. And if we'll I can add well, the other two are, though, uh, the ones that I've mentioned yeah, volume. are yeah. much less traveled areas. Even sure. if you go out onto Clearwater Beach at Acacia, um, that's in a residential area. Okay. Um, we'll take a look. I'm just we'll worried. Sure. sure. If you tighten the radius of that roundabout, won't that affect fire trucks i mean isn't there a code that you have to stay so large in that Not roundabout for safety but and again we've got the apron for yeah, it's a not apron. just tractor trailers really? but also for for uh, fire rescue i mean uh, even i came from hillsborough county public works and we have some roundabouts and we have out in rural areas where people hauling their trailers um their tractor trailers or their trailers for their tractors over them too so mm -hmm. Well, I, I do agree with Commissioner Seal because I could see someone stopping there, and if you're stuck on the roundabout, you're going to stop flow of traffic on both sides that way. Yeah, no, I think it, you know, I, I'm not as concerned about the traffic circle, but what you bring up the location to the trail, and you're talking about queuing and knowledge and also, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at Bel Air <coughs> and the one down St. Pete. Yeah. So uh, I, I wanted to add one comment to that, and I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I, I do think that Again, the idea of roundabouts is to slow traffic down. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems we've been having at the trail, which is, isn't too far down the road, I think, to your point, is people not slowing down enough. And this is like a kind of a no they point. It's, like, it's, it's kind it's of like. It's not matter <coughs> down. They don't stop. Right. Well, yeah. Well, but sure. they don't stop. Agreed. Um, although I, they do stop a lot of times, too. Uh, but I do. But what? Somebody else does. Well, I see a lot of people stop. So. Um, but but I think this slows the traffic down and says, hey, you got a major well, it, uh, a trail coming at you. So I, I'm not, you know, again, I think people learn. It takes time, um, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not well, so anti um, roundabout there. I really think it will slow it down. I mean, you, understand, you Commissioner, as you said, the speed pick. There's a grade change. You know, we've all been yeah. on the grade yeah. is going from the. The, uh, the east to west, it's picking up speed, and that's what's happening in that trail. East to west, east correct. East to west, yeah. And the, and the trail continues to be, we, we got about 1,000 people a day going through that trail yeah. connection. It's a heavy, heavy trail yeah. Um, yeah. item. So, yeah, yeah I we think, need I to think find the, a balance there. I think the uphill west to east, is, it, it's yeah. slow enough, but I think yeah, coming million, slowing it down even more is going to be really important. So, yeah. you know. I, I think, I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. One, one, yeah, one thing I don't oh, know. Yeah. Uh, I think that intersection at Douglas and 580 today is a very unsafe intersection. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to go out and make a left turn, you are having to, you're having to judge whether somebody coming westbound is making a left turn into Douglas or going straight, and then you're having to keep an eye on people coming from the west to the east in order to make that last turn. And because there's a grade change, uh, you cannot see people coming down from the east to the west. 
So it presents a real site visibility challenge. I, and I, so my question sure. is, if we didn't put a roundabout there, I, what else would you put? Because I'm afraid that you wouldn't right. put a signal there because it's too close to the trail. That, that's right. You wouldn't get the warrants for it. You're absolutely right. With, I don't have an answer for you, but it's exactly what you said. It's very wide and unyielding, and it's causing conflict with turning movements. So maybe that's kind of the question is, is there an alternative to a roundabout yeah. that would still achieve sort of the same effects of slowing down traffic and providing access? And I don't know the answer uh, to that. George, uh, if you team here, will study that. It's an alternative. Council Member Gabbert. So I'm curious, because I'm very familiar with the roundabout you're talking about in Coffee Pot, because I go that way to take my son to school a lot on Snell Isle, and I drive around it all the I time. I do, too. Um, so very familiar. But the speed through there is only 20 miles an hour mm -hmm. leading into it. So it's much easier to navigate properly if you're going the actual speed limit. So what would the speed limit proposed be going into it. Look at 25, I believe. Is that right? Is 25. That right? Much yeah, lower. Because I think yeah. that's Slower. important yeah. is how sure. fast are people going as they're leading up to a roundabout mm -hmm. yeah. determines kind of how they interact it with now, it when Bob? they get there. Uh, 35, 35 to 40. 40. Yeah, two, okay, so it'll be significant. So the speed would have to be significantly slower leading up into it, it in be. order for it to actually serve its purpose and for people to not be, as Commissioner Seal said, running over top of it. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and we also we don't want to use that as the speed bump. Yeah. <laughs> no. And, no. too, yeah. to that point, I mean, the way that that one is designed, it really is almost like a little speed bump Any because traffic. in the center of it, it's Everything just bricks. Mm. It's like a decorative design, if you will. Short enhancement. So unless you're from that area, like you don't even really realize what you're coming up on. So it's about the way it's designed, too, that could aid in are, making it more effective. Absolutely. And we're looking to slow the whole thing down. We want parallel parking there, too. This is a whole transformation of what okay. exists today. So, so okay. it, it's yeah. got yeah. all these different features to it and yeah. a spur for the trail. So it's right. a whole different... <laughs> Yes. Okay. So what the, well, I'll be excited to see the transformation as it goes along because I wouldn't yeah. want, I believe in roundabouts and slowing people down and making that, you know, safer for everyone, but <laughs> it just has to be done the right way. So Thank I look you. forward to seeing more. Yeah, I should have mentioned that in the presentation about the lowering of the speed limit and we are calming the traffic and yeah. I want to make sure we're, we're, we are getting the traffic through. We are, I use the term to slowing traffic, but we're actually calming the traffic. Calming. We're still maintaining slower so. going in and slower going through yes, yeah. yes. mayor Bujowski. thank you mr chairman the other two things that weren't mentioned in the presentation were um the other two things we're looking at is adding um crosswalks across skinner closer to the mm -hmm. uh roundabouts because mm -hmm. right now the plan isn't showing crosswalks it shows crosswalks along the side roads but not yeah. not on skinner and we'll definitely need that because that's half the battles getting people across there safely yeah. and uh, also making sure that it's uh, MLK is a work MLK slash Highland is a workable um, roundabout that would include a golf cart crossing there as well so those are two things that we just that weren't mentioned and aren't really shown here but yeah, the mayor. When we presented to the commission, there was a list of items, and as the mayor mentioned, those were two that came up. Is can we look at some uh, safer pedestrian crosswalks, uh, you know, around the roundabout type areas, and then can we also look about the golf carts? You know, we we know we're getting the one on Bass. Is it possible to do something else? And that's what we're going to be looking at too, as the design gets finalized. So all this input is good for us. The, the other thing I just wanted to say is. Um, uh, I was bound and determined to keep my mouth shut today. So, Commissioner <laughs> Seal, I've said the same things at my own commission meeting. I'm the only one saying it. You are? Yeah. I, I'm concerned about the roundabouts in general and how people are going to react to it and if they're used to using it. And then doing it double and then one being close to the trail. I'm just, I have expressed my concerns. However, I'm fully supportive of the people that support this and our staff and our so I've just kind of said, okay, I've, I've made my peace. I, I, I don't think it's a, yeah. I'm concerned. I've expressed my concern too. Yeah, um, but, but we had uh, very strong public participation but, for it. Yeah. You know, it's like, I don't know what else to do. Commissioner Welch. Well, I was going to be quiet too. So. <laughs> no. as, as much as I would love to yeah. see a Dave Eggers, Julie Pajoski roundabout. Right. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. No. Um, no. I agree, no. <laughs> I, I, if you go that route, I just really think 
education and enforcement yeah, on the speeds is important yeah. um, because, you know, it's concept versus reality. And I had this conversation with Wid all the time. I, I don't believe in Sharrows. I mean, yeah. it makes sense, you know, the, the shared bike arrows. Yeah. Yeah. But I never use them because yeah. these mm -hmm. folks in cars yeah. don't know what that is and they don't respect it. Well, and especially and with so many tourists. Right. Um, From all Pasadena Avenue, places. there are a number of places where the Sharrow is there and I just will not use it. So it's education, it's yeah. enforcement if you go that route. Because concept, it might make sense, but unless you've got folks understanding how that's supposed to work and then you enforce it. For, uh, like, I think we all know not to drive over the speed limit in Kenan City on 54. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're going to enforce it. Yeah, gotcha, huh? So it's just kind of educating sure. folks as to what what's expected. Good important thing. So. Here, Brad Bear? Um, I have a question that, to me, the bicycles being on the outside of the parallel parking instead of maybe widening the sidewalk area so that it can be shared by bicyclists and pedestrians. People trying to parallel park, which is not done a lot anymore oh. in society, and them trying to watch out for a bicyclist and people coming around the roundabout all at the same time. It's a nightmare. Um, that right there just seems to be asking for a problem to happen versus widening the sidewalk, letting the bicyclist and the pedestrian share it. And then all the person who's trying to parallel <coughs> park has to worry about it's a car, Absolutely. not everything else. So right now, the as in this concept, the sidewalk are uh, 12 feet wide. So mm -hmm. that would... But it looks like you guys have got a bike lane there, too. There's also a bike lane. So that would... Uh, facilitate uh, bikes on that sh that shared path so you could have pedestrian traffic as well as bicycle traffic. No, I'm talking about on the road. Uh, yeah, on the, the uh, actual yes, street. Yes, there, 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 are, there are bike lanes on the street as well, but the, uh, the uh, sidewalks can accommodate bike traffic. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. There are people who won't ride on the bike on their bike on the sidewalk, just like there are people who won't. I, ride on the I bike understand now. that, but it's I, the, that parallel parking and. How wide is the bike lane? Bike lane seven, seven feet. Seven and how wide is the parking? The eight, parking. Eight feet wide. So that's that's perfectly good for not getting doored. Yeah. We, that's wide enough to not get doored. That's not a door zone bike lane. Yeah, we, we went with the new DOT requirement. For the seven bike seven bike. feet Bicyclist. gives you room to get out of the way of the door opening. And that's assuming that the person is skilled enough to park exactly <laughs> well, they, in They that only have spot. eight feet. <laughs> so. Right. That's good. How, 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 what is the length of the parking spots? Uh, 18 feet, I want to yeah, say. 20. 20. Any, any other questions? Uh, yes, Kevin. Yeah, just uh, sort of talking about the bike lane and being in the street and everything. And it appears to me that the bike lanes are green, right? Mm -mm. No. No. Mm -hmm. It's gray. No, not, not, not in this. The bike, That's the, the grass. The, the grass. grass. Yeah. The green would be landscaping. Okay, so the bike lane and the shared pedestrian would be the gray on yes. the other side of the green? Well, the pedestrian is on the sidewalk in back of the... Go ahead, Chris. In back of the parking. Okay, that's good. Gotcha. There you go. Okay, so the bike lane is in the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that. But it's a much wider um, new DOT standard, seven feet, as opposed to five feet, which you see quite a bit. Okay. So you, you have a wide sidewalk, a grass strip, parallel parking, a bike lane, a travel lane, and then a landscape median. One of the things that we're struggling with that Whit mentioned with these intersections is Right now, Douglas and Highland are very large, very unyielding, very conflict-oriented. And the traffic circle around about just fits in there very nicely to take up that room and make it where the traffic can be configured around it. If you don't do that, and I don't know the answer, and I guess we'll take a look at that, what alternative is, is there? And and if I can just clarify yeah. that the seven-foot bike lane is the standard for a 45-mile-an-hour road. 
okay. not a 25 mile an hour road. So you're really going above and beyond <laughs> yeah. even the DOT standard. Yeah, we, well, we, could, uh, we want to take advantage of the trail being there. That might be the safest bike lane you would ever build anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we would like that. We want to take advantage of the trail. We know a lot of people are going to come off the trail and they're going to come to our downtown. So we did anybody ever ask you why you didn't put the bicycle lane on the inside of the street parking and make that a buffered bike lane? Mm -hmm. uh, no, we had a little bit right here. Uh, That'd be interesting. No, we didn't. It is um, done a lot. I know. Um, Mm -hmm. Nowhere in Pinellas. Well, I know I've also suggested, too, to yeah. see angled parking instead of parallel and maybe reducing some of all of this buffer. Mm -hmm. Well, that's but, a thought. But, maybe for the we... same reason that Mayor Bradbury mentioned, because so many people do struggle with parallel. Yeah, we just don't know what the speeds and the safety, whether... Yeah, we're going to take a look at that. That was one of the items. Yeah. Yeah. If we don't need seven feet, if we well, go Well, that would be like less. Central yeah. Avenue in St. Pete. It's, yeah. you know, at a 90-degree angle. angle and... Yeah. This is a state road, so we don't have total control. Well, they, they, they're definitely getting yeah. feedback. So. <laughs> they probably need to move on. So, Would yeah, it I think be in a I state th road that they're yeah. allowing parking on the state road? Parallel we, parking? They've seen this with the parallel, and they're comfortable with the parallel. Remember, Safety Harbor had that for a long time, yeah. too. It still does, actually. They mm -hmm. have parallel parking. All right, so, so we're going to yeah. see this again. Yes. Right? You know, when it, uh, I'd, we'd like to see it again. We have some homework. Yeah. Yeah. And you got lots of good feedback. I, I think we need to probably move on if the, unless there's um, any. I was just going to say it's just ironic the number of people that did come to all the workshops and were overwhelmingly supportive of roundabouts. That was mind blowing to me. Yeah. I mean, mind Mm -hmm. it, it I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear the number of respondents. But, but Go to Carmel, Indiana. And 15 yeah. and another, and at the second yeah. workshop, there's 13. It's not 12,000 cars a day. That's yeah. not a big no, you're right. response rate. Right. Mm -hmm. But we yeah. have different <coughs> groups each time, too. It wasn't the same amount of people. Same people so. yeah. it's going to be nice. Well, I'm glad to hear that your mind is opening a little bit to roundabout. <laughs> well, my mind is not open at all to it. I just, I, I'm... So it's traversed. Right. It's a four to one. With the will of the it, yeah, it's a 50 people in total, maybe that. Four to one. I'm four to one here. Yeah, just, but we got DOT here, but, you know, we have other partners. It isn't just... There's no, yeah, This there's no statistical sample. Sorry to be so opinionated. Yeah. Well, I think Clearwater <laughs> killed it for a lot of us. So around it really hurt. So. All right, guys. Thank there's, you. Appreciate there's it. There's an easy time. traversed area of, um, what is it, uh, Druid? Yeah. Where there's roundabouts. Yeah. In between um, Belcher and... Clearwater's used it in a Island? lot of places. Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. Cleveland? Cleveland. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there's... Yeah, and that works very well. Yeah. yeah. Those are nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, wait, let's get into the budget and. Um, okay, I'm going to have Rodney Chapman come up and. Hopefully, we won't have as many questions here. <laughs> Good luck. There's no roundabouts in the budget. Uh, <laughs> if we have the backup material that we can actually look at and study ahead of time, then sometimes it's easier. Okay, I uh, just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about the preliminary budget uh, for fiscal year 20. Uh, I'll talk about uh, some revenue sources because we do have a few members that are new to the board for this year, so I'll walk through uh, the process in, in a little bit more detail because what we do here at Fort Pinellas is a little bit different than what you do in your communities. Talk about some of the milestones for our agency and then finish up with objectives and some budget details. So every year we work with the Pinellas County Office of Management and Budget. Uh, to look at uh, projected revenues, expenditures, other special conditions, and that pro process normally kicks off uh, in February. So we've been having ongoing discussions with OMB for uh, a number of months, and this chart shows you the eight-step process uh, that all uh, county departments and dependent special districts, of which we are one, uh, go through on an annual basis. Uh, last uh, a few months, a few weeks ago, we uh, submitted our preliminary budget outline to OMB, and that was uh, step five. And then on May 9th, I'll be going to the Board of County Commissioners to present our uh, budget uh, in an information session where we'll talk in more detail about what we are uh, planning to do for fiscal year 20. So at a high level, uh, Fort Pinellas essentially has uh, a transportation side of the house through the MPO and then a land use side of the house through the Planning Council. And you see on the left that the Planning Council's operations are primarily funded through four sources. Those are property taxes. Uh, the PPC does get intergovernmental revenue from the MPO, and I'll talk a bit about that in more detail on a subsequent slide. There is money we uh, receive in terms of interest 
And then we also receive money from time to time from our local government partners for technical assistance projects that we uh, conduct on their behalf. And then for the MPO, uh, MPO is uh, wholly funded by a combination of state and federal grants. And you see those uh, four grants over to the uh, right. Uh, going back to the uh, Planning Council uh, property tax revenues, what this chart is showing you is uh, for the last 11 years uh, what the millage rate has been, which is that small uh, bar uh, to the bottom in blue, and uh, the available capacity is that remaining area up in green going up to 100%. So in simple terms, uh, the current millage of the PPC is, a, is a 0 0.0150 and has been uh, that way for the past three fiscal years. And going further back into the past, um, that rate has remained relatively stable. Uh, if you go back all the way back to 2004, the rate was 0 0.0220. And uh, what this shows is that we are a very efficiently uh, run organization. We do... Uh, do our best to watch every dollar we spend, and we have been uh, quite effective at achieving our mission while keeping our millage rate uh, at below 10% of the uh, cap maximum. Uh, in terms of the funding, or sorry, the financial machinery that goes on behind uh, the MP, uh, Fort Pinellas, there is uh, there are transactions that occur between the PPC and the MPO, uh, and legally. Uh, all of the employees, whether they do MPO work or PPC work, are planning council employees. There's a staff services agreement that we have that controls the interactions between uh, those two entities. And the PPC actually has a float or floats the uh, personnel cost for the MPO, and then the MPO then reimburses the PPC for those charges uh, on a cyclical uh, schedule. And then there's some cost sharing that goes on between uh, the PPC and the MPO for other types of expenses. Uh, what you see here is our organizational chart. Uh, we have 18 full-time positions. Uh, it's, I couldn't in any way that would be discernible to show uh, a split, if you will, for who does P uh, PPC work and who does MPO work. A lot of us share those responsibilities. Some are 50-50. Some are 60, 40, 80, 20. It all depends on the particular person and the nature of their activities. Uh, I wanted to call your attention to the, uh, the part of the org chart on the left where you see there's two vacant positions. So we have a principal planner that's vacant that we are currently in the process of bringing someone to fill that position. We also have a vacant program planner position that opened up when Alicia Perinello left to go to the city of Largo. So some recent history, uh, those of you that have been around and can recall the uh, unification of the agency back in fiscal year 15, uh, that was a significant milestone for the agency where we uh, hired uh, Witt as the new executive director and uh, continued with having separate uh, but clean audits for both the PPC and the MPO. In fiscal year 17, we uh, rolled out the rebranding and realignment initiatives, including our spotlight uh, emphasis areas, and continued to work towards strengthening economic, uh, strengthening those relationships for, for economic growth and uh, sustainability. And in the last couple years, we've really uh, tried to hit our stride in integrating lanes and transportation planning, where we adopted our strategic business plan and have really uh, I think rolled out a couple of good programs to incentivize, incentivize action from our local government partners in terms of the Complete Streets Grant and the Planning and Placemaking Grant. And we continue over this period of time to have separate and clean audits for uh, both uh, parts of the agency. So, so for fiscal year 20, the objectives remain the same in terms of lining our work program with the business plan to work with our local government partners as well as our regional and state uh, agency partners and uh, the private sector continue to round out our suite of technical assistance projects and programs to our local government partners and then try to use uh, incentives to uh, result in the kind of outcomes we're looking uh, to have for Pinellas County. So for fiscal year 20, there are five main items that the PPC revenues will fund. 
uh, for that period of time. Uh, first and foremost is our regulatory obligations under the Special Act in terms of administering the countywide plan. We'll continue our work on the spotlight areas. We will also continue the planning and placemaking grant program for another year, making $100,000 available for projects that implement the planning and urban design principles of the countywide plan. We will also continue our knowledge exchange series as well as uh, continue uh, our local government technical assistance. And what I've tried to do uh, below that bullet is to talk or s just make you aware of six uh, of the t technical assistance prog uh, programs or projects that we'll be undertaking during fiscal year 20. Uh, in particular, a visiting study with the city, Rock, uh, city of Indian Rocks Beach. Uh, we've been talking to the city of Largo about conducting a walking audit of the Clearwater Largo Road area. We have been having productive meetings with the city of St. Petersburg and Pinellas County about the development of a coastal high hazard area uh, mitigation framework. And we have worked with the Foundation for Healthy St. Pete and other partners on uh, bringing health and all poli policies to <coughs> fruition here in Pinellas County. We'll continue our activity center indicators as well as uh, an exciting project here at the bottom is one that's relatively new is uh, working with Pinellas County and Esri and a ARC Urban GIS platform of which um, we'll share more with you about, about it in the coming months, but it is under Esri's early adopter program. So these last two charts just give you a, a financial snapshot of where we are uh, for the fiscal year 20 budget, the pie chart. Uh, to the left shows you a breakdown of the personal services, which are about 60 a little less than 60%. Operating expenses are about 20%. We're about 21% in reserves, and then about $35,000 or 1% uh, in those constitutional officer transfers. And then the bar chart to the right shows you a historical snapshot over the last uh, five years in terms of the uh, property tax revenues, those intergovernmental service revenues that the PPC receives from the MPO and then uh, the small amount of interest we uh, receive in, a, in an account, as well as that black line showing the millage uh, rate over that same period of time. So the next steps in the process is, as I mentioned before, to go to the Board of County Commissioners at the budget information session on May 9th to talk about uh, what we do here at Fort Pinellas. And then uh, at your June meeting, we'll be asking you to adopt the millage rate and the, fiscal year, the budget for fiscal year 20. Okay. That, I'd be happy to any, questions. any questions for Rodney? Okay, well, we'll see you back in a couple months for that. Mm -hmm. So, appreciate it, Rodney. Thank you. Ready to get into the director's report? Sure. Um, is everybody, for the most part, going to uh, be here for the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes? I don't think it will yes. take that long. Okay. We'll get to it pretty quick. Half an, okay, just want to make sure. We might have to step away for a second. We do that first, and if we're good. I think we're. I think okay. we'll get to it fairly okay. quickly. Um, the next, the first item is the spotlight emphasis area, and I'd like to just first turn it over to Mayor Bajowski. She has an item that's of importance to our enhancing beach community access initiative. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Director. I was call you Chairman and. <laughs> No, don't, don't want to do that disservice to, to my colleague, uh, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, you were fortunate enough to have um, the um, highest attended state park in our city, which is Honeymoon Island. In our slash state. Slash in Yeah, in the state, in but it's located within our city. And um, I, I'm sure Commissioner Seals know, knows about this one, too. It, it, on any given beach day, you could be backed up all the way to um, CR1, if not farther. Mm -hmm. And it and it is a one-way-in, one-way-out kind of road for the majority of it. So um, we've been working with uh, the Parks Division in Tallahassee, the folks out actually on Honeyman Island, for, for some many, 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 many years trying to uh, get them to expand the opening of Honeymoon um, and the number of lanes that they have uh, because we believe that that's a, a huge cause of the backup. And so uh, we finally got a meeting with um, Eric Draper, who um, is the director of the Florida Park Service, along with his staff and our staff. We had to do it um, over Skype. It, it was very techni technical. 
Um, anyway, uh, they do understand, and he actually was willing to have this meeting with us because he was down here, visit our city, visited Honeymoon Island because we received the Trail Town USA designation. So long story short, um, they believe um, what they would like to see happen is to do an additional two ingress lanes with concurrent tool bolt booths, which would then have a total of five entrances, five lanes to get into Honeymoon. Now, just so you know, Honeymoon generally keeps one lane for emergency. So it still only means four lanes of get, getting in. But they would uh, add an additional stacking spaces at the entrance for approximately 50 or 55 more vehicles of queuing before it gets to the causeway. We, we did try very hard to get them to look at just doing the sun pass thing. Um, we also tried to get them to do pay on your way out because they have so so much stacking. So th this was the negotiated thing between us and them that they were willing to do. They had reasons for ev everything that they wanted to do. Um, D they believe that these improvements will increase the flow into the park by 50%. Um, the plan itself, we've heard, is funded through design and permitting, but the cost of construction is $500,000. Um, the officials from DEP believe that the funding for construction is unlikely, given the emphasis on repairing parks in the panhandle, and have asked us to look for other alternatives. Um, given that, um, you know, our, our goal, you know, FDOT, I mean, uh, uh, Forward Pinellas' goal is access to the beach, we all know this used to be a state road. It's going into a state park. Mm -hmm. um, I would really love this board to, <clears throat> you know, write a letter supporting the funding of this construction um, to all the entities that we need to write it to. I think it's the parks. I think it's DEP. I think it's FDOT. Um, so. We just we need to push that this is a huge priority now that they've actually got it funded through permitting and and design. So That's I asked Mayor Bajowski to to bring this issue up to see what the will of the board would be in terms of authorizing me to put a letter together um, explaining the rationale for what we're looking for and approximately how much it costs. Do, do what kind of an estimate do we have? Is that a hundred thousand? I know what the cost is, but do we have any backup of that, or is it just kind of a ballpark? It's figure? what they've verbally given my city manager. I have an email I can forward you. FDOT. Uh, FDOT. No, it came from DEP, right? DEP. Just a minute. Officials from DEP believe the funding for construction is unlikely. That's in a different sentence than the cost of construction. So I don't know who's done that estimate, okay. to be honest with you. But I can forward you this email from my city manager. And of course, you can reach out to her to get more details. The details she gave me were just the high points to put out for you all. Okay. I, what I was just looking for is do we have a, a really good, credible <coughs> cost estimate, or is that sort of a swag ball? I think that's a, I, I don't <laughs> think it's a credible estimate because, okay. I mean, they haven't done the design yet. Okay. So I think what we would have to do is request confirmation of that cost, but that that action is something that we would like to see funded. Well, and I think in the meantime, too, your agency, WIT, the agency here, as well as FDOT is looking at Alt 19, which crosses the road that goes out to Honeymoon, if you didn't know that. We're also looking at safety and and trying to push more cars through that intersection. We're looking at the intersection itself, and that's something that Witt and his staff is looking at. So trying to accommodate it from both ends, yeah. because the backup is outrageous. And we have one hotel that's getting ready to open and another one that wants to build on the causeway. And there's, oh yeah, and there's nothing I have that's a, that we can vote no. But when you, our residents see our, the traffic. I mean, it's like you, mm -hmm. you, you, we're stuck and we need serious help on the traffic in that area. 
So any any written support you all could give us is would greatly be appreciated. And so I related to the mayor that um, about three or four years ago we had a, a, a state earmark for a trail through Honeymoon Island that the okay. Department of Transportation was going to build. And uh, they were short. I think the earmark was for $300,000. It wasn't enough for the trail. And then DEP came to the rescue and built the trail. Um, that was a that was just got completed. Um, so that may be a basis for having some conversation with the state about what they could help do. There might be a need for county participation. Yeah. But yes. I think what we could do is at least put the letter together, get it to the right people, and then um, convene a, a discussion about that. And, and maybe it needs to go on our priority list, uh, but we'll... And I don't know any... Yeah, I don't... At least we'll get the I'm just letter looking to get drafted. It some support from all the transportation people. I think you have Mayor Bradbury. Mayor Bradbury. Yeah. Um, verbally. Is, is there a, um, the design hasn't been done, so you don't know that that's the actual dollar amount. Right. Um, is, I think one thing that would be beneficial to go with that letter is an actual dollar amount. I think uh, maybe this is premature until we get the design and we actually know where it is. But um, except we have to get into their, they won't know either, but they, we have to get into, just like we have this list of priorities, we have to get into their list of priorities in even, even for them to do yeah. the design and permitting. I mean, to wait. So you're asking for the design and permitting also besides the construction cost. Th that's funded. Design and permitting is funded. But I'm at, but they're saying there's no funding because of all what's going on in Panhandle. That's what they're saying. And I mean, I, I think an estimate is better than nothing, is all I'm saying. That's what they've given us. I, I think Witt's comment, though, about the potential different partners, I think is I think is on right. target and, and, and fair to be looked at. So I, I definitely, if there's not, if there's, there's not too many more projects that are tourism driven, as pure as this is, and so I would just, you know, I'm just going to say that there's, I, I think the, that the county needs to be a partner in this too. So I'm not, I'm not going to go there any further, but I do think that we need to investigate all of our partners on this because it's a, it's a major problem. It's a major problem. So, so is everybody okay, at least for the letters to I go I think we're out? just looking for consensus. Yeah. Um, so, so go ahead, Commissioner Seal, did you have a comment or? Did they look at any kind of automated tolling or send pass or anything? Yes, they looked at send pass. They're, they said they're not ready to do it, that it's not something they're even in the number. I said, could we be the the guinea pig, you know, for you? It would be so easy to put. Like, and I, and I wish my city manager was here because. Send pass and why that had to be paid. Uh, that's what we asked for. Yeah. It was an automatic system, get the people out of it, forget it, these lanes. You know, just go, 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 go. And they did have reasons, and I'm sorry, I don't know what they were because I didn't hear them myself. My city manager did. <clears throat> but I can also get that information. Okay. But, yeah, they're not willing to hear that. I think a letter of support is certainly mm -hmm. coming from I, if us. If we're doing the letters, it would be good for us to show some kind of <clears throat> funding where, you know, the city of Dunedin is going to do X amount of percent um, TDC is going to do a but percentage. The county is going to do a yeah, percentage. Yeah, I don't want to hold up the letter, Mayor Bradbury. Yeah. And, and in order to figure that out, we'd have to have it permitted and designed and, and wait. And that's what I don't want to do. Yeah, and, We're uh, asking them to fund it. I think I think we are supportive of the project. And we <laughs> I think that letter is very appropriate. And, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves on the funding and let them off the hook. Right, that's so, the point. We, so th we, we want them to fund the project because they are the appropriate yeah. funder. I think, I think we'd had some good ideas, but uh, are we pretty much in support of giving getting a letter uh, supporting the, the project and what, it, you know, is that? Yes, I see, yeah, okay, all right, there you go. Okay, all thank right, you. thank you. Uh -huh. All right, I'll put that together. The next item uh, on Spotlight, just real quick, is um, I think we've talked about a lot of the beach access. Next May, we're going to bring back um, uh, Mayor Serrano of Indian Shores, wants to give a brief presentation along with DOT about some of, of what they're coming up with. And they have a meeting scheduled next week with the town of Indian Shores to walk them through their recommendations for that sidewalk and drainage project. They are going to be, I think, able to build a sidewalk 
for a significant chunk of, of the corridor uh, because there's existing right-of-way, but there is a short segment that there's only 40 feet of right-of-way, and that's what our placeholder is on our priority list. So we'll need to have DOT just kind of walk through there. They're looking at ways to keep that cost down. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just have that conversation next month. Uh, you heard about St. Pete Beach. So those are really the big things on the beach access. For US-19, um, we have gotten a preliminary um, finding on the northern interchanges from a planning level. Um, and now that uh, is being uh, reviewed by the right-of-way department within DOT because they're looking at these alternative interchange concepts, which they think are feasible, but they don't know if they'll have right-of-way impacts, which might make them you might as well just build the overpass. So they're gonna come back with that information and first thing we're gonna do is have a sit down with DOT and county staff and maybe some city staff and just kind of understand it technically and then bring that back to the board when we're ready. But it's gonna be in right of way for a little while. We're not sure we're gonna have an answer in time for adoption of the long range plan. So we may need to come back and amend the plan or we may need to make an assumption going forward. And that, that's regarding the overpass. That's north, north, of north of Tampa, Tampa. Road, yeah. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's at least moving and it's now in right of way, so that's, that's progress. Um, for the, um, and I haven't seen anything firsthand, so I can't really speak intelligently about that. The Gateway Master Plan, we had a preview of the recommendations yesterday, day before yesterday with the consultant team, and they've drilled down into three study areas. The area just south of the airport, south and west of the airport, which is a lot of surface parking and a lot of county-owned property. Uh, and then <coughs> the ICOT uh, um, Boulevard, ICOT Center area. Um, and then the one up by Tech Data um, in, the, in that business park. And really good ideas, really good designs, uh, significant increases in density, uh, parking garages, things like that being talked about. Uh, there is a fourth uh, study area location that they're going to be looking at and bringing that back. We did not, they're not ready to show that, uh, but we are going to have a study management team meeting in May. And um, uh, Council Member Gabbard has requested that this be placed on the city, St. Pete City Council uh, um, committee uh, agenda in July. Yes. And that'll be a good time to do that. So I'll respond to your assistant okay. about that. Thank you. And, um, That'll be coming back to this board uh, probably in June, if not July, uh, with, a, with a recommendation of the master plan. And, uh, everybody seems really impressed with the consultant's work. Uh, we're pleased with it. The local government seemed pleased, and they've done a good job in coordinating. Uh, one thing that we learned is that um, the intermodal center consultants from DOT were waiting on our consultant to kind of help push them over the finish line with the final two or three sites from their modal center in the gateway area. And so we, we weren't aware of that, but we're making that sure that connection is happening now. So that'll all come together in the next couple of months. So I think we're good on our spotlight emphasis areas and that's really all I have there unless anybody has any questions. Any questions for what? No questions I just wanted to add. I, I did see in my email, Commissioner Seal, that it says as, as far as the sun pass, um, that they were willing to consider Sun Pass for two of the five ingress lanes, but that would not happen for another several years. Mm. Well, that's and good again, news. I think it's a funding issue. So it, yeah. not a, not that they're not willing to, but it, that's still, they still need all these lanes to get because right now there's only three ingress. So sorry to take us off track. That's okay. The last item I want to bring up is just the legislative committee meeting, and uh, we met this morning, and I do need some action from the board on that. Uh, we went through a summary of where some of our priority bills are right now, and I'm just going to run those through you. The committee made a recommendation uh, for the full board to send um, uh, correspondence to our legislative delegation about several matters. One is the protection of trust funds. Uh, there is um, uh, a budget sweep of about $126 million out of the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund uh, for Hurricane Michael relief, I believe. And uh, our position is to keep the trust funds whole. Um, so that, that is a budget negotiations point. Um, so we would uh, reinforce our support of keeping the trust fund whole. 
The second item is uh, Senate Bill 768, which is going to the Appropriations Committee tomorrow. And this is for the multi-use corridors of regional economic significance, the MCORS program. These are the Suncoast Parkway extension to I-10, the Heartland Parkway, and a connection in Citrus County. And um, the committee's recommendation would be to send a message that um, essentially that uh, the existing transportation needs in our urbanized areas have a significant backlog of funding mm -hmm. and um, to uh, support existing transportation needs rather than building new toll roads um, that may not be sustainable from toll revenue. <laughs> and the Hillsborough Commission or MPO, I'm not sure which, I believe was taking a position on this last week. We don't know if they did, but that's my understanding is that the commission was going to take a position on that. So, yes. I would move to support that. A um, couple other things is the distracted driving bill that we were supporting uh, has been essentially watered down to a texting while driving uh, bill as a primary offense as opposed to dr distracted driving. It's not going to go back to distracted driving, so I would just maybe say we should support a texting mm -hmm. while driving as a primary offense ban and get what we can. And then the last one is the micro-mobility bill, which um, is about scooters uh, and other similar kind of devices. There is a House bill that does not have any local controls allowed at all, and a Senate bill that allows, uh, uh, that has been amended to allow municipalities to prohibit scooters in certain areas and allow units of local government to retain control over launching scooters. And according to Councilmember Gabbard, that's consistent with the city of St. Petersburg position, and you're happy with that Senate bill. Absolutely. So we would send a message saying we support the Senate bill to retain some local control over that. And there's some home rule stuff that's happening, but that's really out of our wheelhouse, and there's a lot moving on the vacation rentals, and I don't know that there's a single bill we can focus on right now, and again, it's not really our core issue. So if y'all are good with that, um, we would send a message um, basically reinforcing that, that I think we need a yeah, vote. Yeah, can we take, have a motion for that? We need uh, a motion to support. Move approval. Second. second. A motion and a second. <coughs> I, I know it's late, Mr. Chairman. Did y'all discuss the preemption bill that would re require referenda, like a potential transportation referenda mm -hmm. to have 67 percent did you we did discuss it uh, we can certainly include that in our opposition uh if you want us to do that uh that was the senate bill oh, I um, spoke with uh, senator brandis when we were up there is much better it only requires it during a general election yeah. which is fine but the house bill requires super majority by the county commission to put it on the ballot and then 67 percent yeah. to win the election and that's just uh Sure, the commission's going to oppose it. FAC opposes it, but if we're going to support a future yeah. transportation referendum, I think we ought to oppose it as well. Is the, I guess that'd be. If well, I mean, I, you know, I hear opposing it, but I'd almost uh, what do we support? You know? The Senate bill. Okay, so Which, uh, I'd yeah. rather say that. I'd rather be a positive <laughs> statement about what we we are supporting, and by definition, they can get it. I, you know. If they if they get that we that the sixty seven percent. Well, is that, is that not, that's not in the... It's in the House bill. Yeah, but it's not in the Senate bill. We're supporting... It's the not in the Senate bill. Yeah, I, well, maybe for the next legislative, but they'll, they'll be wrapping up pretty soon, won't they? Well, that's the last legislative committee before the session. Yeah, this is in. our last chance to, right. to put that in there. Um, what, is the, what does the Senate bill say on, on that? It's the Senate bill on that is really just requiring it be in a regular congressional election year. Yeah. So if we could and strongly support the Senate bill... Mm -hmm. I would, I would like us to do that. Okay. Is that okay with uh, everybody to add that so, in? Yeah. Okay, anything else? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Good. Thank you. And that is all I have on director's report. Okay. Anything other informational? Um, uh, you have the regular items and the informational. There's fatalities map and trail data. Um, up stakeholder meetings uh, and then upcoming meetings yeah I think under um, under committee vacancies we have a uh, CAC has an opening for the Pinellas Park mid-county area and LCB has two openings uh, for a citizen who is a TD writer and an opening for a public education representative so continue to look for 
for help in that arena. Can we um, send a note over to the clerk and then I will ask her to post it on our web page. Okay. Yeah, sure. Any anything else? Um, upcoming events? Anything you want to mention? Highlight? Uh, what? No, I think uh, they're self-explanatory. Okay. Uh, and I would just, uh, again, finish with what I started, and that is that uh, we have an evaluation form uh, that is uh, to, <laughs> that needs to be done and end by next Friday, please, so we can uh, have uh, the review is planned for uh, when? Is that uh, or May 8th? Okay, our meeting in May, so hmm? and make sure we get all of our shots in now. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, so please, let's, let's get those in. And uh, anything else here? Okay, we are adjourned. <laughs>